Here's the kick. Four seconds to play. There's the snap. The placement kick is on its way. It's got the distance. It's no good. It's no good. Jacksonville wins. Jacksonville wins. It's no good. Jacksonville, we've got a winner in Houston. Yes. And what a day it was for the expansion Jaguars as they're now in the win column. It's hot and humid in North Florida. Conditioning will be a factor in the fourth quarter as the Steelers have come to play Jacksonville. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Don Tricky with Beasley Reese. It has been a very big week for these Jaguars, a week of celebration in North Florida as Mark Brunel came off the bench to lead the expansion team that now no one wants to play to its first victory. Now he's the man, Beasley. Well, Brunel did a great job. He's a young man. This team switches quarterbacks a lot now, but I believe this is something different. He did a super job coming back in the win. If you take a look at his statistics compared to Steve Berline, another fine quarterback, but Brunel has done a better job when it comes to completion percentage. He's also the team's leading rusher. And the Steelers are back on track. A big win over San Diego, coupled with a Cleveland loss, elevates the Steelers back into a first-place tie with the Browns. Additionally, Pittsburgh gets back in starting quarterback today. Neil O'Donnell, who's been out since week one with a fractured hand, ready to go again. Well, here's a look at the injury. You'll see him fall down on his throwing hand. He's got pins and weird bumps and protrusions in that right hand. Now, Don, here's the big question. The question is taking the snaps. Normally, a quarterback takes the pressure on his right hand, said, hey, boom, and so it hits him right in here on the hand. Now, what he's doing is moving his hands around a little bit. He's trying to catch the brunt of the blow with the left hand, said, hey, and so that could be a problem. We'll track it for you throughout the game, but the coach says that it will not be a problem. Here's a look at it. See, move that left hand around and catch the brunt of the blow with the non-injured hand. That could be a factor, and once again, we'll track it. Very good, Beasley. You go in as the third quarterback. If anybody goes down, you're taking that snap well. And Neil O'Donnell was all weak. Bill Cowher said the reason he really wanted to get him back in soon is he did not want him to uh, be troubled by six weeks of inactivity because the Steelers go to a bye week next week. So he wanted to get him back in the lineup. You know, there's a good close look at the hand. You can see the red area over the pinky finger. That's a bump that's about a half inch up in the air also. So um, it's something to certainly keep, keep your eyes on during the course of this football game. But he wants to play. The coaches want him to play to make sure that he doesn't have to sit out six weeks and then come in in a critical situation. They've got the bye week next week. And that'll help in the healing process as long as he does not bump it again today. The Jaguars, interestingly enough, have just won the toss, and they've done that for the first time this season. Coach Tom Coughlin said, we still have to get more consistency. He wants to see four quarters of good football. He knows what the Steelers plan to do. Pittsburgh is back to its power game. Run the ball right at you. Control the clock. When San Diego started to come back last week, the Steelers went to the power run game in the fourth quarter and controlled the ball for 11 of the final 15 minutes for Bill Cowher. He says his team, too, has a Jekyll and Hyde personality. He's looking for a personality on this team that is more consistent. Bill Cowher is a great coach, a great guy to talk to. He's a great motivator in our meeting the other day. It was just, you know, you're excited just to sit with the guy and listen to his philosophy on football and coaching, the way he handles his players. He's a player's coach. Just a wonderful guy. He's done a super job. They're off to another great season. Billy Jackson is back deep along with Jimmy Smith. He received the kickoff for the Jaguars. Ron Johnson ready to kick it off, and he is into the ball, and we're underway for a sold-out crowd of 73,000 at one of the great stadiums in football. Here's Jimmy Smith for Jacksonville. And he gets the ball to about the 21-yard line. There, Jacksonville goes first and 10 after a 20-yard return. Chris Holden was down to make the tackle. Tony Baselli, the number two player picked in the entire draft, now back in at left tackle after a knee problem. He is terrific, but he'll find out how good today when he has to face up with some of the great Steeler rushers. Rinell at quarterback, James Stewart is a rookie from Tennessee. He's their prime runner. Jackson and the former Heisman winner, Desmond Howard, started wide receiver. Jacksonville will go to a double tight end often with the former Boston College All-American. Pete Mitchell, a good pass catcher. And first and ten, Brunel takes a look. The Steelers come with a blitz from Chad Brown. Brunel is on the run, and he's got some room. And Brunel is ahead for 12 yards. 
and a Jaguars first down. That is their offense. In case you haven't seen the Jaguars play very much, Brunel has been one of the most productive players on the team. He's the leader when it comes to yardage gained on the ground. If it's not there, he will tuck it down and take away. Now, this is not to say he's a running quarterback, but he certainly does it well. You see him here finding his blocking. The linemen first know that he might run, and they immediately jump out front. It's a good game for a first down and a good start by Brunel. You see he is the leading rusher almost eight yards a carry for this third year player from the University of Washington. Originally a Green Bay Packer and a cutback move. The Jaguars get a good run straight up the middle. A penalty marker goes down. Brenston Buckner Joel Steed and Ray Seals across the defensive front. And there's going to be a holding call looks like Beasley signaled against Jacksonville. We look at the lineup of the Steelers in their secondary. Deion Figures no longer starting, coming in as a nickelback. Willie Williams and Al Void Mays, the starting corners last week. They each had two interceptions, each ran one of them back for a touchdown. So they've stepped in nicely for Bill Cower in the absence of their all pro Rod Woodson, who's out for the season with a knee injury. And Deion Figures still troubled by the knee that took a bullet last summer in Los Angeles. Unbelievable, unbelievable story there by Dion. But they say he's about 75 or 80 percent back, so we may see him in the game a few times. Rennell takes a deep drop, lets it go with the left hand, wide open is a tight end down the field with the ball, and inside the 40-yard line is Rich Griffith, and the Jaguars burn the Steelers with a deep hit. They were looking run, and a 39-yard pass play is the result. Well, fans in Pittsburgh, if you haven't seen this team a lot, it's a team that does a, a super job when it comes to mixing up plays, play action there to James Stewart. This is a superior throw and an even better catch by Rich Griffin. That had to be a blown uh, coverage in the secondary, in the fine secondary of the Pittsburgh Steelers there, Doc. It was a blown something because that 39-yarder and Griffith was running all alone. Again, Brunel drops, fires in the flat. Again, he has an open receiver. As all of a sudden, the Jaguars are ripping open the vaunted Steeler defense. Willie Jackson, Jacksonville's leading receiver with a 16th catch, another first down. This for 21 yards. Willie Jackson is a new and very exciting player on this football team. You see that Alvoid Mays is giving him plenty of room. He turns out of his backpedal too soon. That's the reason that Jackson is open. A DB should be able to backpedal longer than that before he's forced to turn out. Great effort after the catch by Willie Jackson. So the biggest plays of the season in succession for the Jaguars as they now have gained 60 yards on consecutive pass plays. Willie Jackson with 15 catches. He got 13 in the last two weeks. That was his 16th, and it's good for a first down. Here's a handoff. Slanting running, and power running is James Stewart. And all of a sudden, this Jacksonville team that ranks number 30, dead last in the NFL on offense, looks like the 49ers. Don, suddenly we realize this is no accident. <laughs> this is good blocking up front against one of the most famous defenses in the league. They are doing whatever they want to do against the Pittsburgh Steelers. There's Kevin Gilbride, the offensive coordinator. He's put some great offenses together, of course, when he was in Houston. And, man, is he calling some plays right now. Really changing it up, going deep early. They've been conservative, and they're breaking out of that mold right now. And uh, Stewart cutting back. He's close to the five-yard line where the Steelers' nose tackle Joel Steed and Ray Seals, the right end, combine on the stop. Coach Coughlin told us that, uh, and Kevin Gilbride also told us that suddenly this team really believes it can win games. I mean, the way they responded in the latter part of the Houston game, we see James Stewart with a little limp. He's playing with a banged-up shoulder, taking a lot of hits, the rookie out of Tennessee. Randy Jordan will take his place, number 23. We saw him make some good plays uh, early on in the season. Yeah, he scored their first touchdown on a 71-yard pass play against the Bengals. Don, I tell you, this is no accident. These guys are blocking, running, good play calling. They are pushing the Steelers down the field. 
And now the Jaguars have it second down and goal at the Pittsburgh six. Rennell quick of foot takes a look he'll not get away from the Steeler rush this time as Princeton Buckner who was doubtful in midweek is back in the lineup and the first man in on the set. You know when I looked at this game and started to uh, try to analyze what would happen. You know, I figure there will be a lot of sacks today because Brunel's going to hold the ball. He's going to look to run. That time, good coverage by the secondary. They were in a zone down at the goal line, and that's always a killer for an offense. You expect man for man most of the time. You call a play that's successful in man for man. When they run a zone, sometimes you're caught with nobody to throw to. Brunel, sometimes when he's caught with nobody to throw to, is at his best, though. He's a good runner, but here come the Steelers again. And over the middle, throw and a connection. It's in for a touchdown. Cedric Tillman on a slant pattern takes the throw from Brunel who eluded the rush and Cedric Tillman goes in the end zone with his first touchdown. Well coached football team. Brunel gets good protection up front. No harassment whatsoever. He's able to look and find Cedric Tillman and Tillman backpedaling into the end zone. So a sensational opening drive by the Jaguars their best of this season their first season now on the field for them is Mike Hollis to try the point after Brian Barker is his holder and the kick is on the way in good. So an early surprise at Jacksonville Stadium and with 10 18 to go in the first quarter it's the Jaguars seven and the Steelers nothing we're watching the NFL on NBC. Look at the bottom of your screen, number 27, Willie Williams. When they start to play, he will start to cover Tillman, then point him off, turn him off to another man at the top of the zone. That player not getting there fast enough, and he simply backs in. He let him go to Greg Lloyd, number 95. Zone coverage, the guy saying, you, 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 me, me, me. Williams says, you, you, you to Greg Lloyd, and Lloyd not able to get over there in time to keep Tillman out of the end zone. And some sensational numbers, Beasley, for Brunel. Three of three for 69 yards in an opening drive and a touchdown. Here's Ernie Mills for the Steelers. Breaks it across the 20 and gets out close to the 25 yard line. He runs into a stone wall there. Santo Stevens makes the knockdown for the Jaguars, a return of 22 yards. The offensive front for the Pittsburgh Steelers, led by all pro center Dermotti Dawson. Neil O'Donnell with Steve Avery starting at fullback today because of the injury to John L. Williams. Eric Pegram, a real threat running the ball, a super quick back to it, 93 yards and three quarters against the tough Charger defense a week ago. Pegram, good yardage, hangs it across the 30 yard line, up to the 31. He got it close to a seven yard gain. Take down on the play. Uh, the middle linebacker McManus was on the play. Here's O'Donnell taking the slap snap. You see that he catches the brunt of the pressure that time actually with the right hand, the injured hand. And you know, Don, I kind of figured once he got in game condition in the heat of the battle, you can say whatever you want to say, but he's going to do what he's done for 19 years, and that's take that snap the way he takes it. Yeah, that's probably right. It's <laughs> awful hard to change. O'Donnell is to the run again. Again, it's Eric Pegram with all those cutback moves. He's to the 35 yard line and close to a Steeler first down. As the front four for the Jaguars, their best player this year has been the right end, Jeff Lagerman, 56 out of Virginia, the former New York Jet. He's been one of the best defensive linemen in the NFL. Joganius, the middle linebacker, has moved to left linebacker because of injury there, and McManus starts a middle linebacker. Corners are veterans, they're solid. The extra DB coming in on the nickel, which they play a lot. Right now, the Steelers go to a power set. Two big backs, Bam Morris and Steve Avery. Morris is the deep back on third and inches. That's Bam. And he goes boom for three yards. First down, Pittsburgh out to the 37 yard line, stopped by Don Davey. This is the offense that the Pittsburgh Steelers would like to employ throughout the game. Solid running, not too much pressure on O'Donnell to throw coming off the injury in his first game back. They'd like to see 
three four yards of pop and then a first down by Big Bam Morris and that's what they got here in the first part of this series. Once again about O'Donnell he's been a quarterback for 19 years he's not going to change the way he takes the snap. There's his offensive coordinator Ron Earhart. O'Donnell again goes to the run they'll run it till they stop it and they did stop it on that play. Goganius a linebacker the former Buffalo Bill number 54 makes the knockdown on Eric Pedro. You will find that this Jacksonville Jaguar defense is a pretty talented group. They're rated around the middle of the National Football League. Look at Goganius and Davey Pritchard, all of those guys closing up the inside and converging to the ball quickly. It's an impressive defense, especially for an expansion team. It is. It grades out in the top half of the league on defense. Offense was rated number 30 and last, but that opening drive changed some minds. There's an out pattern goes to the fullback Steve Avery, and he's got taken out by Mark Williams. Gain of about six yards on the play is James Stewart, who set all the rushing records at Tennessee, a first round draft pick, one of two that the Jaguars had in their first season. It's the right ankle retake. Andre Hastings has been a big factor on third down for the Steelers. 19 catches, and 11 of them have come on third down. He's in the game now. There's Andre in the slot to the right. Four wide set. O'Donnell in the shotgun. He stands in. There's the rush. And O'Donnell gets it away nicely. And the ball is taken out to the 45-yard line as Fred McAfee gets it out of the backfield. But he is short of a first down, so the Steelers will have to punt on their opening possession. They send five receivers out into the pattern, Don. As a result, there's not a lot of people left to block. So you see that McAfee comes out immediately. He doesn't check to block anybody. O'Donnell very uh, athletic to get that ball out of his hands at the last second. Yes, he was, but was not resulting in a first down. Desmond Howard is back deep for the Jaguars. The punter, Ron Stark. He's blocked. Markers are down at the line of scrimmage. Steelers were lucky because that negates the play. A false start comes before the snap of the ball. That is a huge break for the Pittsburgh Steelers because the Jaguars were about to pick that up and walk it in. Of course, it helps you to block it. Right. <laughs> that was a huge. Oh. Rarely do you get a penalty. It's a big break, but that was one. You can see that this punt block is going to come again, though. There's an overmatch somewhere in the middle of the Steeler blocking alignment. The snap. Another big rush. Stark booms the ball. On the six yard line, Desmond Howard turns to the outside, and he's taken down in a good open field tackle. Coming up to make the play was Fuller, and that will give the Jaguars the ball at their 16 yard line as the NFL and NBC continues with Jacksonville in a 7 0 lead. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Honda, who offers an impressive family of cars, sport utility vehicles, and minivans. By Northwestern Mutual Life, there are a lot of good reasons for choosing the quiet company. And by Red Dog Beer, bold yet smooth, unusually easy to drink, you are your own dog. Desmond Howard also with an ankle turn on the punt return. So he's being looked at, checked out. He looks like he'll be ready to come back in as the Jaguars, leading 7 0, go back on offense. Burnell again with a first down throw, loses the ball. He shuffled it under him. He might throw as a catch. The Shine Mastin's fullback ran over the middle when he saw his quarterback in trouble to give him a safety valve to throw to. They rule here that Burnell's pass is an incomplete pass, it hits the ground. But uh, that's too long. You can't hold the football that long against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Good call by the referee. The end of the ball does go down. James Stewart back in the backfield now for the Jaguars. And the 
Steelers shut down Jacksonville's run. Action happened in there as James Stewart tried to go wide left. Joel Steed, the nose tackle, came across and got him. That looks more like a Steeler defensive effort. That last drive by Jacksonville is cause for a legitimate concern on the Steeler sideline because the Jaguars are rated 30th dead last in offense in the National Football League. That shouldn't be happening to the Steeler defense. But it did, and in that opening drive, Brunel threw three times for 69 yards and a touchdown. Payoff in from 12 yards out to Cedric Tillman. Here's Brunel against a big rush. He's hammered. Kevin Green coming from the left side. Broke over the block. Ryan DeMarco, a rookie tackle from Michigan State. And Brunel is shaken up. Well, Brian DeMarco, number uh, 73, right there blocking against Kevin Green, is a decided, a classic, and unbelievable mismatch. Green is one of the best rushers in the league. DeMarco is a big, strong man, great pass uh, run blocker, but not real quick feet. He'll have trouble with Green, Don, all game long. Yeah, that was evident there. Once an offensive lineman spins around, it's over. Here is Andre Hastings running the punt back for Pittsburgh. He's really stepped up, done a great job for the Steelers since the injury to Rod Woodson. And that will give the Pittsburgh Steelers the ball at the 37-yard line here in the first quarter as Jacksonville still leads 7-0. With Beasley Reese, this is Don Crickey back at Jacksonville Municipal Stadium. Reggie Clark, linebacker for the Jaguars, being looked at. As Neil O'Donnell drops and throws on first down, a well thrown ball and a square out to receiver Charles Johnson. That's four, about eight yards. They expect number 81 to catch a lot more balls now that Neil O'Donnell's back in Beasley. They really timed up well last year together. I promise you, there's nothing wrong with Neil O'Donnell's ability to throw the football. The out pattern is the most difficult to throw in the game. It's the longest throw from the middle of the field all the way to the sideline. And Neil delivered that one perfectly with a lot of zip. So I guess we can put the rest to rest the hand story unless he gets hit on. Yeah, they said he threw well all week, and that was evident there. O'Donnell now gives to Eric Pegram as he breaks it up. Now to midfield. He has a first down for Pittsburgh. Eric Pegram out of North Texas State. An interesting story. He gained almost 1,200 yards two years ago with Atlanta. Last year, when June Jones took over as coach, they ran him barely not at all. They went more to a controlled passing game, and Steelers got him as a free agent. He's a good runner. He offers a uh, tremendous change of pace to the Steeler offense. A lot of speed. I'm worried about his ability to hear. You know, he's got that Cadillac with about 90,000 speakers in it. Loves his music real loud. Yeah, he's got a walking boombox or a riding boombox. Here's the throw in the flat. Again, O'Donnell swings it out this time to Avery. As the Steelers with a controlled passing game move the ball methodically down the field. But they've been surprised early on the out, the outstanding offense of the Jaguars on that first possession when they went down the field and scored. And Avery's an interesting story. You talk about never quitting. This is a guy that was cut seven times in the National Football League. But, you know, that's what sports is all about. Don't quit, never give up. And here he is on one of the finest franchises in the history of pro football he's a Pittsburgh Steeler 29 years old and just his second year with the Steelers Pegram runs on second down and six not a lot happening there as he shut down quickly on the tackle was Tom McManus the little middle linebacker for Jacksonville he played for Tom Coughlin at Boston College talk about Pegram's car he's got a 71 Cadillac DeVille about 90,000 watts of speakers in the back seat. The mean Green Eagles and Beasley Reese among them. <laughs> hey, nice job, guys. It's a fine institution. Yes, it is. It's had a great program, too, over the years. Big stick put on Charles Johnson. Coming up to make the hit was Vinny Clark along with Dave Thomas, number 41. So the Steelers are shut down on third down and Ron Stark again comes out to punt as the Steeler drive is stopped. The Donna Jacksonville Jaguars are not a team that you want hanging around That's right. because they play solid football. They won't make a whole lot of mistakes. All the Steelers we talked to yesterday echoed that same refrain. The longer they hang around the tougher they're going to be to beat. 
And they're hanging right in here as a punt off the side of the foot of Ron Stark, but he does angle it inside the 20, and it comes out of bounds at about the 12-yard line. So it worked out well. 33-yard punt, but it's all net yardage, no return. The Jaguars will have the ball when we return with the NFL on NBC. Next Saturday at 5 o'clock Eastern Time, NBC Sports takes a look on what has been a truly great year and a one to remember in the world of golf. Who can forget Corey Pavin's putt shot on 18 to frustrate Greg Norman to win the U.S. Open at Shinnecock? It's been that kind of a year. Relive the great moments, the USGA year in review next Saturday here on NBC. Brunel with a quick drop, fires it out, makes a connection, gets the ball out to Willie Jackson on a slant pad, and they have to do it that fast. When we talked with Kevin Gilbride yesterday, the offensive coordinator for Jacksonville, it was interesting, Beasley, he said, no matter how much you try to simulate the Steeler defensive speed in practice, you can't do it. When you get in the game, they're faster than the guys you're practicing against. No, in order to simulate Greg Lloyd and Kevin Green coming off those corners, they would have to put defensive backs there to run and get those tackles used to that type of speed. Here's a handoff up the middle. James Stewart, the big back from Tennessee, runs Arnell Lake. Long safety for the Steelers comes up and gets him. Arnell Lake is one of the special athletes on that football team. He is the eighth and unaccounted man in the defense. You set up your blocking scheme as an offense to take care of the linebackers and the defensive linemen. If you're successful and a hole is created, for Pittsburgh, they've got an all-pro safety who's always standing there. That's what he did that time. Maybe the best pair of safeties in the NFL and Carnell Lake and Darren Perry. It's uh, number 37 Lake. But it is a first down for Jacksonville. Rennell, quick drop, long ball. Just overshoots the fleet Jimmy Smith, the former Cowboy, running a fly pattern on the far sideline with a step on Elvoid Mays and Mark Brunel Beasley with a big league arm. Pump well, down 65. Look at the pressure coming from the side here. This is the number one concern that they were talking about. You see Kevin Green get around Brian DeMarco. DeMarco is a rookie. He's taking a lesson today. And so he's got probably the biggest challenge on this football field today. Stopping the great Kevin Green. He outweighs Green by about 80 pounds, but in and foot speed, it's not on the same planet with Green. And 10 times stronger than Green. Doesn't help when he runs around you. <laughs> James Stewart again. Carnell Lake stops him. DeMarco was the second round draft choice of the Jaguars out of Michigan State. Very good run blocker, but he's got to get those feet moving quicker to withstand the likes of Kevin Green. Well, Donnie's 325. It's Carnell Lake again, see? The team had everyone else accounted for. Look at him. Read the play instantly. Shoulder in the right position to to, to stop James Stewart on that very spot. Same spot he hit him at. He stopped it. Tough play now for Brunel and the Jaguars. Third down. They need ten. And here comes the Steelers with a blitz. Lloyd is coming. They pick him up. There's a throw and a drop. Wide open was Willie Jackson. And Dion figures covering him and not very well. A perfectly executed play and a drop by Willie Jackson that will not put him in good stead with Coughlin, who cannot abide mistakes, even with a young team. He made a couple of good catches in this football game, but you know, he saw figures coming up. I'm surprised that figures pulls up there. I mean, that, that could have been a simultaneous ball hitting the body, man hitting the receiver. Dion should have given him a pop there. Ryan Barker gets the ball down and Andre Hastings to return the punt for the Steelers. He lets the ball on the field. Jacksonville has it. The shy Maston gets it to the 31 yard line. First big break of the game goes to the expansion Jaguars a 56 yard punt. But Hastings who's run one back this year for 72 and a touchdown offs it up. They try to tell you to stay on the ground, but when a guy gives this type of effort, I don't know what you can say to him. Hastings trying to gain more yardage, jumps up in the air, gets the ball pulled out of his hands, watch the leap. That's a great move. And then the leap here as he tries to jump over a crowd of people. Ball comes out of his hand, and the opportunistic Jacksonville Jaguars enthusiastically grab it and get ready to go on offense. 
And shaken up. It looks like Mastin recovered the fumble. A little slow getting up. Probably fell on the ball. So while he's attended to after a very big play, Jacksonville gets set to continue its offense at the 31 yard line of Pittsburgh. This is a huge defensive stand for the Steelers. When we were talking with Coach Bill Cower, he said that his team got out of rhythm, out of their game plan a few times in the losses because they got in situations where they had to throw the ball every time. Now, this is the 19th turnover for the Steelers, and they had 17 all last season. So you can see this is a team that's not going in the right direction when it's coming to mistakes. Now, Tom Coughlin said yesterday the league is a buzz with uh, talk about the Steelers who usually protect the ball so well turning it over so much early seven turnovers against the Vikings in a blowout loss. Brunel stands in here comes Green Brunel fires downfield and it's off the hands of the receiver and somehow he got the ball right where it had to be downfield but it was incomplete. Even a huge rush could not keep him from throwing it accurately. Don if they don't get number 73 Brian DeMarco some help. Somebody has got to hit 91, Kevin Green. Now, as I look at the replay, I realize that DeMarco wasn't on Green that time, but you can't let a guy like Kevin Green come flying in there untouched. Nobody blocked him. Renault now four of nine throwing the ball for 77 yards and the touchdown that was in the opening drive when he was perfect throwing it. Renell on the run. Not done. Dives down to the 21 yard line. It looks like he has a Jaguar first down. A man who makes it happen. He's finally taken down by Chad Brown in Carnell Lake. And now was caught, seemingly lost, but once again he escapes. Don, don't look for the slide, okay? This guy, this guy becomes a running back as soon as he starts running. Two rushes for 23 yards. Kevin Green with the miss. Does he slide? No, he bounces to the outside because his determination, his concentration is on that first down marker, and he gets there. So as the first quarter is about to wind up, the Jaguars are challenging again, leading 7-0. The shy Mastin who recovered the fumble booms his way inside the 15-yard line. He gets down to the 14. So it has been a big quarter for the expansion Jaguars as they lead the favorite Steelers seven nothing after a quarter of play. On a humid day now becoming overcast in Jacksonville Florida the Jaguars as we open the second quarter challenging at the Steelers 15 yard line second down and four coming up. The Jaguars completely outplaying the Steelers right now. There's young Mr. Baselli, Tony Baselli, number one pick by this team. He's doing a good job. You haven't heard us mention his name. His counterpart, Brian DeMarco, also a rookie this year, very talented, very strong. They say he takes 405, 405 pounds, and does reps with it, meaning lifts it over and over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that doesn't help you lift Kevin Green when he that doesn't help you get your feet out underneath Kevin Green. So it goes by you like a golden black blur. <laughs> but the Jaguars have completely outplayed the Steelers so far in this game. Pittsburgh, a two touchdown favorite in the local papers. Here's a throw by Brunner, makes a connection. Ball is taken down by Craig Keith, a former Steeler. He's down close to the nine yard line. It looks like he has a Jacksonville first down. Chad Brown finally got him, number 94, pointing to his former teammate. <laughs> Well, Brian DeMarco, number one, does a good job on green, giving Brunel the ability and the time to throw to that side. And then this is not the this is not the Steeler defense. This is not Steeler defense. Steeler defense does not allow a tight end to catch the ball and drag people. They better wake up down there. Brunel hands off. Now they run, going heading for the end zone and down to the goal line, but not in. Is James Stewart pumping his legs, a man who broke all the University of Tennessee rushing records. He was the 19th player picked in the draft. And the Jaguars leading 7-0, challenging to put up another touchdown. Don Coughlin checks the play sheet. 
That, they're giving him the touchdown, Don. They are giving was, it to him. Yeah, I was about to say, if that's not a touchdown, it's as close as humanly possible. Wow, well, delay call, but they do give a touchdown to the Jaguars. We'll watch again. You know, it looks like this ball lands just shy of breaking the plane. Let's see. Oh, well, I, I didn't see him break the plane, but... Well, somebody did. Maybe. Somebody saw it. 20 seconds after the fact, two arms went up, and it is a touchdown for Jacksonville. Mike Hollis now on to try the point after. The ball is picked up and good. One of the interested spectators today as the Jaguars have taken a 14-0 lead is Chuck Knoll, the great Steeler coach of yesteryear, and we'll be talking to him when we come back. Coach Bill Cowher and the Steelers up against it right now, trailing the underdog Jaguars 14 to nothing. And the man who preceded so successfully Bill Cowher, Chuck Knoll, coach of four Super Bowl championship teams. What about this game, Coach? Well, these are always the toughest ones, uh, where the general wisdom is that you're supposed to win and win big. Uh, those were always the toughest games to uh, prepare for. What are you doing now? Uh, well, I'm trying to do as little as possible, but it's not working. Well, stay here for a minute, if you would, Coach, and take a look at this with me and Beasley as we see the kickoff coming downfield. Running the ball back is Ernie Mills for the Steelers, and right now these Jaguars are a pumped-up group. A 14-yard return on the play. So you have to wonder, what would Coach Cowher, what would you tell a team at halftime? We're a ways away from halftime, but they've got to regroup. They really got hit with some big plays early. And they sure did. Uh, you know, it's uh, you just go back to uh, what you've been doing and what you've been doing well. Uh, actually, uh, they want to run the football, obviously. That's the way it looked in the first part of the ball game. Neil's hand, I guess, is fine. Yeah, he seems to be throwing well. O'Donnell leads the Steelers. First down and 10. Hand off. Eric Pegram runs and breaks it across the 35 and out to the 39 yard line. A gain of 19 okay. yards and a Steeler first down. Is Coach, that a North Texas State That's yard? a North Texas State <laughs> yeah, Coach. And that's the kind of play that you need. You need somebody to make a play like that to shut down the crowd and to change the momentum a little bit. No question about it. Now, what kind of blocking is this, Coach? Take us through this. Good play. blocking. <laughs> And that a is big, a large a hole. hole. <laughs> well, he's been quite a find for the Steelers. I mean, this guy is a nice little shot in the arm. A lot of spark. The Steelers need to an answer on this drive. Down 14-0 early in the second quarter. Pegram again. And again, he breaks it to the outside. It's a foot race. Darren Carrington finally gets him out of bounds. And a penalty marker down at the line of scrimmage, which Coach Noel spotted right away. Well, Coach, it must be on a lineman. The lineman didn't move. They stood right there. <laughs> Those big guys are not going to run downfield and have to come back. Mike Carey, the referee. The offense. That's the standard, so it comes back. The big play comes back on a holding call. Or you got what was developing into be a beautifully set up running play. Watch Pinkham here. He's got a nice little lane. Hops over one man, but the blocking was superb. Bruner might have had a hold of somebody. At any rate, someone has called on the hole. We didn't get it with the crowd noise. But it is a penalty assessed against the Steelers, setting them back to the 30 yard line. So we'll see if. Uh, on first down and a long yardage. First and 20 if Neil O'Donnell airs it out. He's taking a deep drop. Here comes the rush. O'Donnell with a spike up the middle and he's almost intercepted. Jonathan Hayes was its target and a rookie middle linebacker almost made the pick for Jacksonville. Brian Schwartz. Uh, O'Donnell here is looking around. I thought he would take number 81, Charles Johnson, come down low, but he tries to get it right between two defenders, and it didn't work out. 
We're with Chuck Noll. Chuck, what went wrong in that opening drive when Jacksonville hit the Steelers with those big pass plays? Where was the breakdown? Uh, you know, they played some uh, just some good football. Uh, you know, I don't know if he had a breakdown as much as he had good play by Jacksonville. Here's a throw to Bruner, the number one draft choice of the Steelers. But everybody in the secondary seems to get a shot at him when he catches the ball, and that brings up third down and long. Beasley? Coach, can you feel the momentum changing inside the game? I mean, you can feel right now that Jacksonville is everywhere. They're hitting hard. They have been right from the outset. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that you have to be able to uh, offset by your play. Uh, you you know you meet a team and they're all fired up and uh, then you have to come out and uh, let them know what's uh, what's going to transpire and uh, so far the Steelers haven't done that. Jacksonville keeping seven back to defend against the pass a throw by O'Donnell he gets it out to Charles Johnson looks like he's going to be out of bounds at the 45 a couple of yards short of where Pittsburgh needed to go. He got 10 on the completion but they needed 12. That was very close but I don't think it's now he didn't get it for the first down. He did not get it. Hey, this stadium, Coach Chuck Noll, sounds like uh, Free Rivers at playoff time. <laughs> this is a fantastic facility. It really is. I've never seen a better one. Mm -hmm. Fen sensational. But it has not been a great day for Pittsburgh so far as Jacksonville with a 14 to nothing lead, ready to get the ball back. Ron Stark to punt the ball for the Steelers. The humidity comes into play here, particularly in the fourth quarter. Conditioning's a factor when you play down in Florida and this early in the year. Well, it's not uh, not as bad early in the year as it is late in the year uh, because uh, it's still warm in uh, the northern cities and you get used to uh, uh, the fluid transfer. But uh, when you come down here in December and it's hot, uh, that's when you really have a problem. Uh, we had a few people, uh, uh, you know, with heat prostration in uh, in the first in pregame warmup, I should say. Mm. You know, because you're not used to that fluid exchange. Right. You're up there practicing in the cold weather. Uh, you know, I think uh, right now they should be all right. Chuck, what about the emotion of the game? I mean, they've won such a big game a week ago, the Steelers did, beating their arch rivals in the rematch of the AFC title game. Keeping that emotional high, even when you want to do it, is awful tough to do. There's no question about that. And uh, that's when it's, uh, you know, really tough. you got to get your message across. Desmond Howard, with the punt return, gets out to the 17-yard line. A 47-yard punt by Stark of the Steelers, an eight-yard return with 11.08 to go. Jacksonville ready to take over the ball. And we say thanks to Coach Chuck Noel for stopping by. Tom, thank you. Let's get back and watch the rest with Dan Rooney. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by the all-new Ford Taurus, a look you've never seen from a name you know well. By True Value, the official hardware store of the NFL. By Bud Light. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down, make it a Bud Light. And by McDonald's, have you had your break today? Jacksonville with a big start. They took the ball and went down the field with Brunel throwing three times, completing all three for 69 yards, the final one for 12 yards and a touchdown to Cedric Tillman. They've built in that lead since after a fumble recovery of a punt. And now it's the Jaguars with the ball on a 14-0 lead, opening the second quarter with a running play on the ball in the hands of James Stewart. Knocked down by Joel Steed and Carnell Lake. Beasley? James Stewart is um, taking just a basic play over the left side, running behind Baselli and Jeff Novak that time. And uh, you have to watch now to see what the play, how the play calling changes for Jacksonville up 14 to nothing. Will they keep it wide open? Will they get a little conservative and try to take it to the halftime? We'll see. Second down. We're now with a 
Very short drop, not even a three-step drop. The rush was so great from Kevin Green. He tried to loft it to Pete Mitchell, but he couldn't get it to him. As the Bills continue to lead the Jets, 3-0. That was a blink. That was a uh, blitz by Cornell Lake. You see 81 there in your monitor. Desmond Howard went down and actually blocked a quarterback when the ball was being thrown to him. That's because he didn't get the uh, adjustment. He didn't get the checkoff. That puts Brunel in a hole now. Third down arises. He was originally a fifth round draft choice of the Green Bay Packers. Jacksonville got him in a trade. Eagles were trying hard to make a trade to get it. Here's a screen pass to Shai Maston in a terrific defensive play. Greg Lloyd, number 95, the all pro linebacker, blew by the blockers, made the stick, no gain on the play, and Jacksonville has to punt it to the Steelers. Don, those are the plays that really go unnoticed in football. Yeah, had he not have made that play, Lachey would still be running. He had two blockers in front of him. That's a great Steelers athletic Andre play Hastings. for Lloyd to get between them and Brian make the stop. Andre Hastings back to return the punt of Brian Barker. There's Andre. Maybe a little jittery. You recall he fumbled his last one. Big hit downfield. He lets it hop. And it's down by the Jaguars at the 28-yard line of the Steelers. So Neil O'Donnell in Pittsburgh goes on offense after a 49-yard punt by Jacksonville. The NFL on NBC continues. The Steelers' first half possessions, punt, punt, and punt. And the possession that was so short-lived when Hastings had the ball on a punt return and coughed it up. Subsequently turned into a second touchdown by Jacksonville. O'Donnell run down almost a late hit Don Davey coming after him and here's a flag down and well there should be one as O'Donnell released the ball and Davey crashes on him and Donald probably said hey man you're doing your best I know but it was late O'Donnell was trying to set up a screen that time and it just was not open Jacksonville was everywhere we can catch the last part of this play. Neil is trying to wait for the running back to work his way clear. Then he just throws it out of bounds. Two fouls on the play. Pass interference against the offense, number 43. And wrapping the passer, number 92 on the defense. Go foul off set. Replay, first down. Well, Jacksonville got the better of that ruling. Yes, and how? <laughs> well, you know what? You're not. You can't ride the court. Once the quarterback lets it go, I mean, I think he was okay hitting O'Donnell, but then when he wrapped him and dropped his weight on top of him, that's where you got a little bit out of the rules. You can't do that. Well, that's how so many of these guys are getting hurt when the 300-pound lineman, particularly an artificial turf, crash him down and yeah. driving his shoulder into that hard surface, right. like knocking him down into a parking lot. This is a great playing field, not that awful artificial turf. Here's a handoff to Eric Pegram straight ahead. He's across the 35 yard line out to the 37 gain on the play of about eight yards. Kelvin Pritchett makes the stop. The surprising part about pre Pegram's play is he's a small guy but he runs like a much larger man. Now you'll take a look at the end of this play and you watch how many yards he'll take Pritchett for. Pritchard hits him now. One, two, three. He carries a three, a 280-pound man. Another three steps. Well, he prides himself on his toughness. Does Eric Pegram? Said it began when he first started playing football at age five. And the hot Texas son. Two-hour practices. Here's another run by Pegram. Nobody could take their helmet up. Nobody could drink water. He said, "You learned to be tough early under my first coach, Coach Sparks." Well, you never forget that first tough coach. <laughs> And you keep getting them. No, nope. and you and they're, they're lined up in Texas. All of them are cool. <laughs> it's they the national be game. Holding on the offense, number 66. Ten yard penalty. He keeps sucking it out. Hey, if there's two places where football's big time. It's Texas and Pennsylvania, particularly Western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Texas and. I know what Pegram's talking about when he talks about that heat and the fact that in those days they wouldn't give you any water. That was a sign of weakness. I guess when you passed out and they brought you around, they had, they'd gotten away from that now because they realize how the deleterious effect of not drinking water is 
They're going to need a lot today on this hot, humid day in North Florida. Charles Johnson running a deep pattern. Good coverage by the former New Orleans St. Vinnie Clark. So O'Donnell trying to get something going deep as his counterpart Brunel did early in the game. But so far, nothing happening for the Steelers with big play offensive drives. Steelers still shooting themselves in the foot with penalties. There's the third down man, Beasley, 88, Andre Hastings. 11 of his receptions right. on third down. If I was uh, looking at the scouting report, that's who I'd be doubling right now if I'm Jacksonville. Johnson goes in motion. O'Donnell takes a look, throws an out pattern. He was looking at Hastings, but did not time up with him as Hastings tried to come back at the ball, and the Jaguars' defense holds again. Let's watch well, Hastings. You know, if we look at the stats and figure that out, you got to know Jacksonville is looking at the stats. They know that Hastings is the big guy, and look at Vinny Clark is practically squatting waiting on him to break out. As a result, O'Donnell had to be very careful with the throw. These same two teams play at the end of the month at Three Rivers Stadium. I think it's October 29th they hook up again. Desmond Howard lets the punt drop. It's down. And the Steelers will send their defensive unit back out again. The Carolina Panthers are now in the lead. They're leading the Bears 10 to 7 on a 66 yard carry Collins to Mark Carrier touchdown pass. Collins is in there getting the nod now. Seven million dollar bonus. I guess you got to put it to work. Yeah, he. If I gave him seven million dollars, he'd have to go to work. It was interesting. A <laughs> Crawford yesterday, Beasley, talking about he thought the Steelers were going to try to pound the ball at him, but he said we're not easy to run on, and they haven't been. The Steelers have gotten some running gains from Pegram. Here's an out pattern now as the Jaguars go on offense. And Javon Kirkland comes up to make the tackle. You will notice, Don, that the Jaguars are throwing very short passes, three-step drops. They know that they don't have a lot of time, so watch this. One, two, three, and the ball is gone, and you saw that Kevin Green is there slapping Brunel every time he lets the ball go. Look at the pressure coming from the top. Green is so close, but Brunel and the coaches are smart enough to call quick plays. They have to. The Steeler outside rush is so fast. Here it comes. Handoff goes, and James Stewart working hard on second down and does well to get about two yards out to the 40 yard line with Chad Brown, who is the AFC sack leader and inside linebacker from Colorado, 94. Uh -oh. Makes the stop. It's getting ugly. It's getting ugly over there. I saw one of the Steelers kick at somebody. Let's watch Tony Baselli, the standout rookie tackle against Green. Real challenge to Marco actually. Left to Marco on a running play this time, smothering uh, Kevin Green. Marco won't have he won't have trouble pushing anybody out of the way on the run. Got a bright future. They've got to get him to take some ballet or some karate. Get his feet up. He'd have to be faster to hold off these outside backers. Two All-Pro players for Pittsburgh. Dalton says this is the best linebacking core in the NFL, and that is an on-target throw. Mark Brunell to Pete Mitchell, who goes low to the ground, makes the grab, and it's a first down for Jacksonville. Well, this is like a surgical incision here. Nice time, and right on the money. Well covered, but Mitchell allowed to go down low and away from the defender because of the accuracy of the throw. Brunel now 7 for 13 throwing the ball for 97 yards and a touchdown. Jacksonville leading by the surprise the biggest of the season so far 14 nothing. Good D by the Steelers. Carnell Lake the strong safety came up and separated the ball from tight end Rich Griffin. You will hear Carnell Lake's name all the time. He's a leader on the defense. An all pro. Brunel this time has no pressure. Well, yes, he does, too. He gets away very quickly. Defense has two concerns with Brunel. He can get it away quickly, and he can get away quickly. Now, that time coming in on him was LeVon Kirkland. He's a very pressure. quick runner. If there's a gap, he'll shoot into it. He comes into the game, does Brunel as the leading rusher for the Jaguars, almost eight yards a carry. Now he stands in, delivers the ball downfield, and it's almost picked off. 
Coaches around the league, Beasley, talk about the Steelers being one of the best teams, maybe the best, at grabbing tip balls. When it's in the air, they're pretty good at intercepting, and they work on it all the time. Yes, they do. It's a it's a classic defensive back drill. You throw the ball to one DB, he bats it up in the air, the other one goes after it. Uh, they had a touchdown from a tip ball last week by Willie Williams. Caught a nice tip, took it in. Brunel is not big, six feet, 215 pounds. He needs whatever bulk he has to withstand the hits he's taking. This is third and ten. Look at him. Throwing on the run. Wow, did he get it? Official says no, it came in on the hop. Pete Mitchell was the man, but it came in low. Myron Bell, number 40, covering for the Steelers, almost a first down throw. Mark has to buy time for himself. He, he thought he had this one. Look at him. <laughs> it's remarkable time after time when you're sure they've got him and they're going to sack him for a loss. He eludes it and breaks a run. Now with fourth down coming up, Brian Barker must punt the ball for the Jaguars. There's Andre Hastings to run at that. And over and punt it short. Hastings comes up on it, takes a Jacksonville roll inside the 15. And it's finally down to about the 12. So again, the Steelers get the ball, but with the long field to go and a hole to dig out of, they're down 14 to nothing as they come in as a two-touchdown favorite. Right now have a major problem. There was good news and bad news for Bill Cower. Certainly the Cleveland loss on Monday night that helped the Steelers gain a share of first place was good news, but then following this incident, when he took some photos of an alignment and shoved him down the front of referee Gordon McCarter's shirt. This was all about that 12 men on the field call when there was really only 11 and the Vikings got a chance at another field goal, which they made. Well, the league came down hard on Coach Cower. Here's the incident that uh, he wanted McCarter to be sure and look at it at halftime. He didn't want to see it, so he gave him a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, a picture worth 7,500 to the coach? <laughs> but McCarter was fined a games check, and so was the line judge Ben Montgomery. As Bill said, it was a debacle. <laughs> a debacle. Here's a swing pass, nicely done by O'Donnell to Steve Avery, and he takes it across the 15-yard line. You know, Don, a local radio station in Pittsburgh uh, got involved with that fine situation and raised $500 and. Coward gave it to charity, took the money and gave it to charity and paid his own fine. So just a good guy, classic good guy. Very he, emotional. <laughs> he's going to be around a long time. You better believe you will. His players really like Love playing him. for him. And he's delivered the goods, a playoff team every year. They'll be back in this game. This is going to be close at the end. They're down 14 nothing now. Eric Pegram runs the ball and gets to the 19-yard line. There's some stuff going on between the Vikings and the Oilers. For more on that, let's go to Greg Gumbel in New York. Greg? All right, Don, the Oilers had an interception return for a touchdown, called back because of a penalty. Two plays later, Warren Moon to Chris Carter. Second touchdown of the day for Carter, 17 yards, 17-6. to six. Vikings lead Houston, Don. Thanks, Greg. Warren Moon saying during the week, he... He's validated his claim that the Oilers made a big mistake trading him. And they did. They're not anything like they were when he was there. Third and two. Here's a shuffle pass. It goes to Fred McAfee. He didn't, I don't know. They're gonna, the spot's going to be everything. And now the linesman comes in. And it looks like they might get a favorable spot. It was a third and two play. Kelvin Pritchett, a top defensive lineman who came in the expansion draft from Detroit. As the man who made the stop as the yard markers now come out. Minnesota leading Houston 17 to 6. Tampa Bay is leading the Cincinnati Bengals 10 3. He got there. So there's never been much good news for Coach Cower and offensive coordinator Ron Earhart. The Jacksonville Jaguars Beasley with 10 first downs so far. Not many for the Steelers. Really outplaying the Steelers. The Steelers with uh, four first downs in this game. That lets you know that the offense is going nowhere. 
They've yet to have good field position in the game, have the Steelers. Jacksonville with a 14 0 lead. O'Donnell lofts it long, wide open is Yancey Thigpen in a race. He's caught and taken down by Darren Carrington. But the Steelers finally hit a big play. Somebody didn't cover the Steelers' most productive receiver, Yancey Thigpen, a 41 yard gain. Here's a great look at it working against Vinny Clark. Vinny Clark allows him to go by because Vinny has the short zone. The safety, Harry Colin, is supposed to come over the top. And the safety, he gets help from a safety very, very late. O'Donnell now 7 of 12 throwing the ball for 81 yards. There's Darren Carrington, the safety coming in late. He should have been there a lot sooner than that. O'Donnell throws up the middle, makes a connection, goes to his tight end, John Hayes, who's inside the 30. As the Steeler offense now getting synced together and productive as they advance the ball down to the 29 yard line. O'Donnell looking more and more comfortable. And you have to remember, this is a guy who's had a month off. So he's coming back to work and trying to run, run Earhart's uh, offense. A little bit rusty, but he's starting to heat up. But Gerhardt's got his cell phone in there. Here's a long ball downfield. Johnson goes for it and makes the play. He was bumped. He was fouled. He caught it anyway. And the Steelers have their biggest play of the day. Now they're going to rule him out of bounds. They ruled him out of bounds here. Wow. He was bumped, and then he caught it. I thought that was a great call over the shoulder over the right shoulder of the receiver the one spot that the def defensive back couldn't touch watch Vinnie Clark here he really he's in good it. position he's not looking the bad quality of the throw right there wow that's a tough call that's a tough one okay he's one got in. it one yeah. got one one foot in I tell you they just on the replay. It looked like the official had it there. Had it right. That was Charlie Johnson's fault. You got to get that other foot in on the play like that. Right, O'Donnell comes right back with a 35 throw to Andre Hastings. Slanting over the middle. He's taken down by Dave Thomas, but it's a first down for the Steelers. No, I can't get over that throw. That's hanging tough with the Bills. Look at Dallas. This, uh, and the Smith with the score. This Troy Aikman play is playing in that game today. Even with the bad calf muscle. He was announced on Friday as ready to go. It's unbelievable. First down Steelers. They're down 14-0. O'Donnell stands in. He's got an open man in Avery as fullback. And he crashes inside the nine-yard line. And let's see, were they ruling Avery out? <laughs> they do. Avery thought he was in the end zone. He was in the end zone, but he's gone out of bounds first. Now I can't tell. Are they I don't know what's Somebody's got to put their arms up when it's a touchdown. Apparently they're not ruling him out of bounds. Nobody has signaled a touchdown. So it is a touchdown. An official stood on the sideline like he'd gone out of bounds. No official signal touchdown. Avery hopping along. He's in bounds. All the way. What bounce? It's a Steeler touchdown. We try to bring it to you as soon as we're told. There is yet to be a touchdown signal that I've seen, but the ball is going to be placed for an extra point try. And Norm Jensen, who's made 11 of 11 this year, drives it up and through. So, as advertised, the Steelers will be back in it, and they are already, as you are watching the NFL on NBC, and Pittsburgh will kick off when we come back to Jacksonville. Steve Avery, a guy who keeps trying harder, cut seven times, gets in the end zone as he tight ropes the sideline. They looked like they ruled him out of bounds, but then he was in the end zone, and finally a touchdown for the Steelers on this throw from O'Donnell to Avery. The balance for a big man here is incredible. See him hopping on one leg, working his way in, 6'2", 233. Very talented young man, plays four instruments. And shares his talent. He taught his teammate Justin Strelzik how to play the guitar. Now, can you imagine a little tiny guitar in that man's hand? Get but uh, to break it. <laughs> but Avery uh, needs to be able to play instruments. I mean, he's been through a lot. Cut seven times in the NFL. He needs to be able to write some songs and kind of be introspective. And, 
think about it. Jacksonville will look to run out the clock now with two minutes to play in the half. Try to hold to a seven point lead. Willie Jackson runs it back. Steelers cover well on special teams. The lead tackler coming down for Pittsburgh was Jerry Olsofsky, who himself, number 55, is a great comeback story. Total knee reconstruction. Back in 93, and back in one of the best special teams players again. It is a remarkable story. I mean, they had to, his knee was so bad that they had to take ligaments from a cadaver to rebuild the leg. That's an eerie thought. Yes, it is. He that leg start moving by itself a little bit. Makes makes him makes <laughs> Halloween special to him. <laughs> Here's <laughs> Mark Brunell looking for something. On first down, he throws, makes a connection to Willie Jackson. He dives ahead and out to the 36-yard line. If there's been any criticism of the Jaguars, it has been that their offense was too conservative, but not today. Now the Bears have taken a 14-10 lead on Carolina. This, Jennings. this Willie Jackson is a special athlete. He's getting his opportunity because Ernest Gibbons is, is hurt, but Ernest wasn't getting this type of production. We could see a little competition brewing here for the starting nod. Another throw and a catch by Brunel as he gets it to Pete Mitchell. And the clock continues to run with 1.10 left to play. So the Jaguars, who came in rated number 30 and last and off on offense, coming out firing in a two minute drill. Clock is inside a minute to play now. Jacksonville leads the Steelers 14 7. Brunel stands in, fires on the run. He's got an open man, a beautifully received ball by Willie Jackson. You must hold your coverage hey. when you're facing a quarterback like Mark Brunell. This is impressive. This is very impressive. When he starts running, watch the young figures relax just a little bit. See him kind of relax. Now he's looking back. He realizes that the ball is coming. And 24 yards later, it's a little late. Sold out Jacksonville Stadium. With a lot to cheer about today, the first win coming on the road at Houston last week. Now the Jaguars with a 7-0 lead late in the half. Challenging, and Brunel comes in high to Willie Jackson. Jackson is a former Dallas Cowboy. They really went to the expansion draft and went to quality. They went to the winning teams to get their players. Jackson said every Sunday he'd have to wait till the last minute to find out if he was inactive with Dallas. Yeah, this ball just got away. Now this guy has a... One of the best vertical jumps in the league, over 40 inches, about 36 and three quarter inches, his vertical leap. 40 inches, you can fly. <laughs> 36 and three quarter, pretty good. Yeah, 40. You up around Michael uh, Jordan and a uh, young Michael Jordan. Shai Maston runs the ball and he gets down to the 31 yard line. From there would be about a. 48 yard field goal as the clock is now stopped with 39 seconds to play. Greg Lloyd was on the tackle, so the Jaguars easing themselves into possible long field goal range before the half. Stay with us at halftime for the Domino's Pizza NFL on NBC halftime report. Greg Gumbel, Mike Dickin, Joe Montana will have all the scores and highlights from around the league. Plus a look at Steve Entman of, of the Miami Dolphins, a comeback story from two major knee injuries, the former number one pick in the draft of Indianapolis. That's all coming your way at halftime. And what you're watching here is a major story in the NFL today as the Jaguars lead the Steelers. Burnell eludes the blitz. Now they get him, and he falls on the ball at the 35-yard line. So the line of scrimmage plus 17 yards is the field goal distance. This would be a 52-yarder. And the clock is again stopped with 32 seconds to play in the half. Number 40, Myron Bell on the blitz, uh, right up the middle, flashing by Brunel. He drops the ball and is lucky enough to fall back on it, but that was uh, the Steelers blitzed two additional defenders that time, so that was not an all out blitz, but it's about as close to that as you can get. Brings up fourth down, so. Mike Hollis, the rookie place kicker, is coming on out. Well, if you look at the flags, the kick is, uh, you don't, there's not a lot of wind up there, but 
at the other end of the field you can see the um, flags different NFL flags they're blowing into Hollis's face so the kick will be into the wind making it a long shot 52 officially but it's probably about if you're playing golf you'd call this a 58 yeah. Yeah, more like a 53. Well, with the with the wind, you'd be playing an extra couple clubs, right? Yeah, yeah, you play an extra club on this. Man, you put a charge into that. He hit it. That's impressive. The rookie, Mike Hollis, drives through a 53-yard field goal with 27 seconds left before halftime. And Coach Coughlin and his Jaguars extend their lead to 17 to 7. The expansion team that nobody wants to play, and with good reason. Even Coughlin shakes his head at that one. Into the wind, that's about a 55-yarder if you take into account the wind. He knew it time he touched it. Coughlin had some veteran kickers in, but he went with the rookie, and he's really delivered. Mike Collins, a first-year player from Idaho. Now, a kick like that against the Pittsburgh Steelers would do a lot for a first-year kicker's confidence. <laughs> this is a loud, happy building right now. Jacksonville Municipal Stadium. Seven plays, 39 yards, and then the long field goal. Mills is back deep because the ball is kicked high, a spinning kick. Mills comes up on it. He loses the ball. It's on the field. He picks it up and he's swept under. Oh, you talk about a pump group of guys, Beasley. This is as high as a team can get, Jacksonville. And they play excellent special teams, Don, and the reason is very simple. Most of these guys uh, were brought, were 20 of the players that put in a lot of time for Jacksonville were in the expansion draft. And these guys were primarily special teams players on their teams. So these guys are very good special teams players. That's why you see the coverage is excellent for both expansion teams. And yeah, that's when you talk about to the opposing players, they'll all point out Jacksonville's an expansion team, but these players, most of them are four and five year veterans, that's as right. you point out. Many very good special teams players. Jaguars only had 20 points in the first half all season prior to today. They put 17 on the board today, and the Steelers are stunned as they go to the locker room. And a standing ovation for the Jacksonville Jaguars. They leave the field with a huge surprise on the scoreboard, a 17-7 lead over Pittsburgh. Don, I promise you that the leaders on this football team, the Greg Lloyds and DeMonte Dawsons, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near them. So, from Jacksonville, this is Don Cricky with Beasley Reese sending to New York and to Greg Gum. This is the Domino's Pizza NFL on NBC Halftime Report. Brought to you by Domino's Pizza. When it's got to be great and it's got to be now, it's got to be, got to be Domino's. Well, those of you who have been watching the Steelers and the Jaguars, welcome back to our studios in New York. Along with Mike Ditka and Joe Montana, I'm Greg Gumbel. Here's the rundown on scores and highlights as they stand now. First of all, at Rich Stadium in Buffalo, the Bills leading the New York Jets by a score of 6-3. to three. Jim Kelly and the Bills have won three in a row. Here's where Boomer Esiason got hurt in the second quarter. Under heavy pressure, Bruce Smith with a free trip in. He just levels Esiason, who remained down. And on the field for about five or six minutes, Bruce Smith concerned. Esiason was helped off. He suffered a concussion. His return today is doubtful. The Jets had a third and one from the Bills four. Adrian Morrell loses six yards. The Jets have to settle for a field goal. They are still the NFL's only team without a rushing touchdown this year. Take a look at those numbers. Joe Montana, what do those numbers tell you? Well, it tells me that they should be running the ball a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, you found one thing that, they, that uh, is certain that... Um, 
Thomas likes this offense. They're running the ball. They get down there. They're still having problems in the red zone, getting the ball in the end zone. And if they don't start picking that up, they're going to have trouble all year. Good first half for Thurman Thomas, but it's only a 6-3 to three Buffalo lead. In Dallas, the Cowboys, with Troy Aikman playing quarterback, leading Green Bay at halftime 17-3. to three. Aikman has thrown a 10-yard touchdown pass to Jay Novacek. In Minnesota, the Oilers and the Vikings late in the first half. The Vikings lead it by a score of 17-6. to six. Moon up against his former team for the first time and a new wrinkle in Houston's offense. Chris Chandler slips, gets back up, hits Frank Wycheck for the first down. Houston ran off 10 minutes on their opening drive, settled for a field goal. It was 6-3 Oilers in the second. Moon over the middle into the outstretched arms of Chris Carter for a Vikings first down. Nice catch there. And Moon again to his favorite target. Carter in the end zone, four-yard TD. Vikings led 10 to 6. It is 17 to 6 now at halftime. The Steelers and the Jacksonville Jaguars, the game that you are watching, it's a 10 point Jacksonville lead at the break. Mike, Don Cricky was right. The Jaguars, the expansion team, no one wants to play. Well, right now, I tell you what they're doing. They're taking it to them physically. They're playing very physical football on defense. Offensively, they got Brunel, who's the best guy to run their offense, and they're running the ball at Pittsburgh. They just don't look like they're backing down from anybody. You got to like that. I mean, Tom Coughlin's got them playing tough football. 53 yard field goal by Mike Hollis, 17 7 Jaguars. In Tampa, the Bucks and the Cincinnati Bengals. Tampa Bay has a 10 to 6 lead in the second quarter. First regular season meeting for Bucks coach Sam Weish against his former team, Trent Dilfer, starting at quarterback. He was knocked out of last week's game with a concussion. He hits Alvin Harper for a 49-yard gain here to the Bengal 19-yard line. And with the score tied at three, Eric Rett caps a 49-yard drive with a two-yard touchdown run, his fifth rushing TD of the season. It is a 10-6 Tampa Bay lead as they approach halftime in Tampa Stadium. In Soldier Field in Chicago, the Bears and the Carolina Panthers at halftime. It's the Bears by one. And in Philadelphia, the Eagles and the Redskins, 17-17 tie late in the second quarter quarter. When we come back, we'll hear from Steve Entman, the one-time Colt and current Dolphin, who goes against his former team today. We'll get to that right after this from your local station. This is the Domino's Pizza NFL on NBC Halftime Report, brought to you by Domino's Pizza. When it's got to be great and it's got to be now, it's got to be, got to be Domino's. Welcome back, everyone. The doubleheader game most of you will see at 4 o'clock Eastern time is Indianapolis at Miami. One of the interesting stories in that game is Steve Entman, the former Colt defensive tackle who was the number one pick in the 92 draft. Entman endured a series of devastating injuries before being waived by the Colts and picked up by the Dolphins this past summer. Marianne Grabovoy has Steve Entman's story of anger. What's this, an injury? You know, I'm hurt and I'm getting helped off the field and this was the first time I'd ever in my life dealt with anything, any kind of you know, injury where I had to be helped off the field or, you know, and it was, it was a shock to me. But torn ligaments happen a lot. Surgery, rehab, and Edmund was back on the field for his second season. October 93, Colts versus Cowboys. This time it was the right knee, not one, but two torn ligaments and a blown out tendon. Nothing ordinary this time. This was a career ender. That one was, uh, demoralizing I guess it was just it was terrible I mean my life was over I didn't know if I was gonna wake up the next morning I mean everything I ever wanted to do was done I mean it was it was an injury that was career ending here's two freak injuries and I'm like well wait a minute maybe I'm not quite what I thought I was you know I always felt invincible and felt like I never could get hurt your knee was shattered did you feel that your life was shattered too oh there's no question I mean it was sad to say, but that's kind of what I'd lived for was football at that point in my life, and that's all I wanted to do. With the odds stacked dramatically against him, two surgeries that included a cadaver ligament, Edmonton made it back the next season. Nothing short of miraculous, he lined up to play against Seattle, his own hometown team. When I came back from my second knee, you know, I probably the happiest moment of my life. You know, it was kind of picture perfect. Went right and made a play, and, you know, it was real exciting for me. In that game, he suffered a herniated disc in his neck. Three games later, the pain would force him out for the rest of the season. In three years with the Colts, he would play in only 18 of 48 games. The Colts and uh, Steve and his representatives were not able to get together on a restructured contract, so uh, as of now, Steve... Do you sometimes look in the mirror and see yourself in a Dolphins uniform? <laughs> it's a shocker. 
You know, every, I, I still, I still can't, still can't get used to it. It's a uh, thing where I just look in the mirror and double take once in a while. But what's it feel like to be playing a backup role here with the Dolphins? If I said I enjoyed it, I'd be lying. I hate it, you know, but that's the way it is, you know. Um, I'm, you know, not terribly disappointed in it. Oh, okay, I'm terribly disappointed, but that's that's part of it. You know, I'm, I'm never going to cause any conflict about it. Was there a time where you thought you're never going to get out of this black hole? Yeah, today. <laughs> I still feel like I'm in it. Why? Um, things aren't, you know, like they used to be for me. You know, they're not as easy as they used to be. Eh? You're searching. Definitely. And not sure when the adversity is going to end. That's pretty close. Do you sometimes feel like you're going to fall apart? Oh, definitely. Definitely at times, but I, you know, I keep, keep looking. You try to just look ahead and not look behind. My whole career to this point has just been, you know, basically an emotional roller coaster. Just top of the world, back to the bottom of the world. Kind of just been this emotional thing, you know, up and down, and I'm just wondering when it's going to stop. <laughs> Even out. Even out and just be normal. Do you know what normal is anymore? <laughs> I don't think I've ever known what normal is, but uh, I definitely don't know what normal is right now. Steve Entman uh, still looking to get some more playing time, but but Mike, there, there has to be a real shot of adrenaline when you, when you get a second chance or even a third chance or fourth in his case. Well, I think, Greg, the thing he has to realize, this guy is not going to ever be the football player that people thought he was going to be. I mean, really, he was a great player coming out of the University of Washington, but the injuries have set him back tremendously. I think he's fortunate to be in the position he's in. He's with a great football team with a chance to get that Super Bowl ring. That's what counts. Joe Montana, no stranger to injury during your career. Uh, is there a sudden reaction? Reality all of a sudden when you when you get hurt and you know maybe you thought you were invincible well there definitely is because the thing about him is, as uh, Mike alluded to he was all everything coming out of school and there was a lot of expectations of him and here he is now all of a sudden he's a backup and mentally that's very tough on a, on a guy of his caliber to sit there and have to pat everybody on the back when he's used to being the guy out there performing so that's the biggest uh, part of adjustment for him is going to be mentally all right Joe many of you will see Steve Entman go up against his former team in our doubleheader game Indianapolis at Miami some of you will see Cleveland at Detroit still others will get the Seahawks and the Raiders and now our NFL on NBC halftime activities continue Who to thunk it? Halftime. Expansion Jacksonville up on the Steelers 17 to 7. Kevin Gilbride, the offensive coordinator for Houston last year, and then he was fired and came to Jacksonville this year when they got the first win at Houston last week, said, We talked all the time, Beasley, about we can win, we can do this. Right. But way down, we didn't believe it. Then we won. <laughs> now they believe it, and they've got the Steelers down. And that's exactly what Kevin told us in the meeting. He talked more about that. This team believes that they can beat a Pittsburgh Steelers, and they're out there going out about doing it, going about the business of doing it. It'll be interesting to see what the strategy changes are for the Steelers at halftime. Obviously, they're going to have to start throwing the ball deep more. As we look at the Coors Light halftime statistics, Jacksonville with a decided edge in first downs, but it was that early drive that really set the tone of this game when Jacksonville went down the field. Brunel going three for three passing the ball for 69 yards his third throw for a touchdown. So the young man from Washington who came off the bench last week at the Astrodome lead the win over the Oilers playing even better today. You see the comparative numbers. One turnover in the game and it was big. Shai Maston recovered a fumbled punt. Hastings lost the ball and soon after the Jaguars had their second touchdown. Here come the Steelers now as they come down the field. Ernie Mills breaks it across the 30 and the 40. And Mills works his way all the way down to the 47-yard line of the Jaguars. So the Steelers, obviously the recipients of some heavy words at halftime from Coach Cower, come out flying a 51-yard return. That's exactly what Pittsburgh needed to get the momentum changed and to quiet the crowd and to change the mood here. You are looking at perfection when it comes to decision-making while running the football. He couldn't get another inch out of the play. He milked it for all it had. And that's exactly what Coach Cowell was looking for. And I'm telling you, I wouldn't have wanted to be in that locker room at the halftime. I bet stuff was spitting out of Coach's mouth and <laughs> Lloyd was threatening people with karate and DeMonte was grabbing folks. Yeah, could have gotten <laughs> in there. 
O'Donnell, he's looking deep early. Lost the ball downfield. Look at Charles Johnson diving at the ball and making the play for the Steelers. Down at the 26-yard line of Jacksonville. Did you see the throw? <laughs> he put it right there. The receiver didn't have to slow down. Look at O'Donnell. Play fake. Look how smooth and relaxed he let. Look, it's like a dart. The receiver Johnson. doesn't have to adjust at any, doesn't have to slow down, doesn't have to speed up. Doesn't have to come closer, back up further. The ball is right there. For a 23-yard gain, so the Steelers coming out fast here in the third quarter. And uh, Pedro, who hadn't gotten the ball late in the second quarter very much, ran a lot early in the game, runs very well behind that haunted Steeler trap blocking. Straight ahead for a gain of eight. But the Steeler offense has always been one of my favorites. You see the guys pulling, trying to get the correct angles. Pegram very elusive. He brings Darren Carrington, number 29, to his knees on the fake there. Exciting little run. He's putting up some numbers, too. Nine carries now for Pegram for 48 yards. First down, he gets it. Jaguars get him. Going for a loss. A tremendous defensive play. Working hard to get him. Joel Smengi, number 99, was the man who made the stop in the backfield. Pegram will do anything with the football. He'll reverse field. He'll do anything. Mark Smengi, 99 here. Okay, misses him. He's on the ground, but does he stay on the ground? No, he does not. He jumps up and grabs him by the foot. That's a big man with a lot of hustle. And that brings up third down and eight for the Steelers. Opening drive of the third quarter. Pittsburgh down by ten points. Home run ball to the end zone. Man is open and it's broken up. Yancey Thigpen had the ball on his numbers, but coming up to make the play was Roderick Green, number 26, who split the ball from the receiver, and the Steelers are denied a touchdown, and they send out their field goal kicker. Don, that is so difficult because... The defensive back has his back to the receiver in this play. He has to turn around, contort, distort his body to find the football and then knock it away. That's a play to be proud of. Norm Johnson's kick well, 9 of 12. This will be a 41-yarder. Ron Star Coles, the kick is on the way, and Norm Johnson, a two-time Pro Bowl player, drives it through. And the Steelers get points off the opening drive of the second half. And they now trail Jacksonville 17 to 10. Be back as the NFL on NBC continues. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Chevrolet Trucks, the most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. By New York Life, the company you keep. And by Pennzoil, the motor oil that works like liquid ball bearing. Don Cricky with G Beasley Reese back at Jacksonville, Florida. Norm Johnson of the Steelers just hit a long field goal to get Pittsburgh points off its opening drive of the third quarter. But the Jaguars, a two touchdown underdog coming in, still lead the game 17 to 10. Let's see how they respond now. Well, Pittsburgh needed 10 points, three and a touchdown. Doesn't matter what order you get it in, so they are very happy to come away with that field goal. Wind is really kicking up. It's a swirling wind here in North Florida. Temperature in the 80s. There was heavy rain last night. A 20% chance of rain today. When it rains, it can come down hard. You heard an earlier report on the NFL and NBC. Jim Gray talking about the possibility of five inches of rain in South Florida, where the Dolphins play the Colts later today. The rule in the NFL, Don, is that uh, you've got 40 seconds to kick the ball. If, you, if it's blown off twice, Someone has to hold it. Darren Perry will hold. And he does. The ball is hit well downfield. Jimmy Smith elects not to bring it out of the end zone. The Jaguars will take the touchback. They'll go from their 20-yard line to go on offense first down and 10. As we check, the 10-minute ticker. Buffalo now extending its lead as Thurman Thomas is running through the Jets. Over 100 yards rushing in the first touchdown of the day. They're still great. Yeah. <laughs> They can still deliver those old guys. Using <laughs> some new defenders. <laughs> and so up on Houston. Boy, Warren Moore wants that one. Well, here's a good football game. Tampa Bay and Cincinnati. Sam 
twice in the last yes, yes, yeah, That's team. right. Carolina okay, yeah. looking for its first win. Hanging tough at Soldier Field against the Bears. Philadelphia. Wow. We're getting better. And first down. Bruner. They're now running it out, and he rolls out across the 20, and he's not done until he gets to the 30 yard line. And that is elusive. Levon Kirkland, number 99 of the Steelers, the linebacker from Clemson, finally ran him out along with Lloyd. And Don, like I said earlier, don't look for the slide. This guy is not, this guy's trying to run a touchdown. He's not trying to get a first down and then slide feet first like the other quarterbacks. Even watch him here at the end. Still trying to stay in bounds. <laughs> Only one turnover so far in the game. That was committed by Andre Hastings of the Steelers on a punt return. As the Steelers turnover count is now at 19 for this season. They had 17 all of last year. And that turnover was subsequently turned into a touchdown by Jacksonville. Jacksonville has led 7-0, 14-0. 7 They led at the half, 17-7. And now the Steelers with the third quarter field goal down by seven. It's going to go down to the final gun. The Steelers will be right back in there knocking on the door. Jacksonville has to keep mounting offense to hold him at bay. And off of the pitch back. James Stewart doesn't get much as the nose tackle. Joel Steed of Pittsburgh sheds the block, makes a head-on hit. Mark Brunell came in this game as the leading rusher on the football team. 20 carries for 153 yards, and we've seen brilliant decisions by a young quarterback. He has run the ball when he should run it, and he has run and then found open receivers when it's been available. He's made some terrific throws, absolutely. The MVP of the 1991 Rose Bowl when he led Washington to victory. And a straight ahead run by James Stewart. Steelers come hitting Carnell Lake, the strong safety. A head on strike. And that will bring up third down after a gain of four. It'll be about third and seven. It was a second and 11 play. Kevin Gilbride, the architect of the Oilers run and shoot in their salad days when they went to the playoffs seven straight years, had the number one offense three of those years in the NFL. And he was fired last season after earlier the Oilers had not allowed him to be interviewed for a head coaching job at South Carolina very lucrative job and soon after they fired him as coach but now he's back flying his trade with the young Jaguars as Grinnell throws and finds an open man at Cedric Tillman who led off the scoring today with a touchdown reception he's ahead for first down the Steelers were in the defense that they would like to be in for this particular play see number 40 Myron Bell moved to the center of the football field. They had people right where they should be. But Brunel finding a receiver open right to short, just below that spot. So Tillman with another good catch. And a good second look. Our producer today for NBC Sports is, is Kevin Smolin, our director, Dick Klein. And we're coming to you from sold out Jacksonville Municipal Stadium, one of the great stadiums in football. Used to be the Gator Bowl. They completely redid it. And there isn't a better facility anywhere. The playing field is magnificent. The stands. They do it all right here getting this team underway. Don, this is a beautiful facility. Like you say, I, don't, I never played on a finer piece of grass. I mean, I walked around on this thing, and it is prescription. It is gorgeous. Talking to Dan Rooney of the Steelers, the possibility of the city of Pittsburgh would one day refurbish the Three River Stadium. Certainly the Steelers are deserving of it, but Rooney, the most respected owner maybe in any sport, because his decisions are all based on what's best for the league, is not campaigning for city money. Willie Jackson gets the reception and gets down inside the 40-yard line down to the 36. But Don, this is the third time that Willie Jackson has caught a pass and made the first guy miss. I mean, that's, he is showing some really big play potential here. Now, you see the blocking is very good. Brunel on a quick throw. Look at the first man misses. You know, that's an extra five yards. I mean, this, this guy is exhibiting a lot of potential. He is. Hard 
throwing left hander throwing strikes Jacksonville looking to answer the Steelers scoring drive and they go to the run in a terrific defensive play by Kevin Green three time all pro from Auburn the locks are getting longer but the speed is not diminishing maybe he'd be like Sampson you cut his hair and he's nothing well let me tell you something you get the scissors I'm I'm not getting the scissors <laughs> no he says he won't cut it till he, they win the Super Bowl now, if, if Tony Buscelli or Brian DeMarco have any nerve, they'll grab him by that hand and sling him back. We've not seen that yet, though. <laughs> We've not seen that. <laughs> and I doubt that we will. Second down and ten arises for the Jaguars. They pick up the blitz nicely. Brunel gets it away somehow to Willie Jackson on maybe the play of the game for Jacksonville. Brunel in the face of an all-out blitz. They were going to level him, and they did. A split second before, though, the hit came. He threw a perfect strike for 18 yards in a first down. What a play by Brunel. Just the patience because he had to wait a while, and then once again, Jackson makes the first defender miss. Watch the pressure at the end of this play. Would you have the nerve to stand in there and wait for you to see for that long? You're asking me? Oh. I'd be out of here. <laughs> I tell you, that took guts and accuracy. And Brace under pressure. He's been demonstrating that all day. Here's the handoff and running high with the ball down to the 16 yard line. Comes James Stewart, tackled by the free safety, Darren Perry. You know, Don, the first step in realizing that you have a problem in life is, you know, to say it. The Steelers are in denial right now, man. <laughs> they had better wake up. Because this team is pushing them up and down the field. This defense is in denial. Well, we somebody, somebody's got to shake somebody yeah. by the face mask and say, hey. They need to hunt turnovers, do the Steelers. Jacksonville protecting the ball very well. As the Emperor Chuck Nolan was with us in the first half. The great Steeler coach who led them to four Super Bowls said these are the toughest games when you're supposed to win. And Brunel sees nobody open. The rush is coming. He unloads it. To nowhere, the right thing to do. How smart is that? You see a lot of young quarterbacks still try to stick it in there. Or they hold the ball until they are sacked. There's Dick LeBeau, the former All Pro defensive back with the Lions, now the defensive coordinator for the Steelers. Throwing in combinations. He's got a lot of good people to send in there. But Jacksonville, very well prepared on both sides of the ball. Their defensive coordinator, Jacksonville's. There's another former Lion defensive back, Dick Duran. Done an excellent job with his team. It grades out in the top half of the league on defense. Screenplay. Steelers are there. Nothing happening for James Stewart on third down. He's shut down by Brimston Buckner. But it puts the Jaguars in very good field goal range. So Coach Coughlin looks at the options, sends out his kicking team, and the young guy who boomed a 52 yarder, Mike Hollis, is back on the field. John, the, the Jacksonville possession count has been very impressive. I mean, if they make this field goal, it'll be touchdown, punt, punt, touchdown, punt, punt, field goal. If they make this one, add another field goal. You'll win every game you play if you can keep that up. The field goal is picked up and good by Mike Hollis. He delivers again with 6.03 to go in the third quarter. Jacksonville again extends to a 10 point lead and the Jaguars kick off as the NFL on NBC continues. The St. John's River flowing by Jacksonville, Florida. And where it's at today is Jacksonville Municipal Stadium. Really rolling and rocking as the Jaguars again up by a 10 point margin over the favorite Steelers. Kick. Ernie Mills does nicely to take it on the run and gets out to the 31 yard line. And that's where Pittsburgh goes back on offense, first down and 10. Dumas, Mike Dumas, came down to make the tackle a 14 yard return. So let's see what Neil O'Donnell and the Steelers on offense have coming up. Coming up next on most of these NBC stations, it's game two of our NFL doubleheader. Most of you will head to the Silverdome as Barry Sanders and the Lions go against the tough defense of the Cleveland Browns. 
Some of you will see the NFL's only undefeated team, the Dolphins, go against Marshall Falk and the Colts. Others will see an AFC West showdown as Seattle visits Oakland. Check your local listings for the game in your area. A doubleheader day on NBC Sports. Right now, the surprise of this day in the NFL is the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Steelers trying to come back, and a great throw by Neil O'Donnell, right on the numbers of Yancey Thigpen, resulting in a gain of 25 yards all the way down to the 45-yard line of Jacksonville. Beasley? That's another excellent throw by Neil O'Donnell. It's a very simple play. The receiver comes down, and Yancey breaks slightly into the seam in between the two, the safety and the corner. Easy throw, easy catch. O'Donnell more and more in rhythm throwing the ball. Oh, he looks good. His return after fracturing his throwing hand in the opening win over the Lions. Another look, another sharp throw. Right on target, this is Thigpen on the run. He's inside the 10 and down to the five-yard line. And the Steelers looking to get it back quickly, and they do with another big throw. They're giving O'Donnell time, and he's firing it in laser sharp, 38-yard gain. Well, you won't find a better look at it than this. He's allowed to go inside because it's a zone. The cornerback just passes him off to the safeties. He catches the ball in the pocket, and it's a foot race and a fight with Carrington and Colin. The answer at the leading receiver for the Steelers. O'Donnell's got all the time in the world and puts the ball on the money. Thigpen with three catches for 106 yards. He has 30 catches for the year. On the run, going hard is Eric Pegram, and he's cut down at about the three-yard line on a first and goal try. Harry Colin, the strong safety, made the stop for the Jaguars. Well, you have to respect Pegram. That offensive line did a good job on the right side that time. Leon Searcy, Justin Strelzy. Houston inching closer at Minnesota. Watch these linemen here. Strelzik, 73, pulling around. Good lead block from Avery. And Oliver Gibson comes in, Beasley, the 285-pound defensive lineman from Notre Dame, a rookie. Oh, man. Who is a very athletic player. He played varsity basketball one year at Notre Dame. And he is a blocker, and that's what's coming up. Power run, it would indicate second and goal from the three yard line. Don, that should be a weight limit. <laughs> like like Little League football? <laughs> like Little League football. Over 150, you can't carry the ball. That's right. You can't block from the backfield. The guy that started next to Gibson on the defensive line for Notre Dame, Jim Flanagan, has been doing it for the Chicago Bears. Yeah, but it goes back farther than that, guys. Oh, so to the great one. Shall we, shall we cheat the refrigerator? The refrigerator not only would block it in, he'd run it in. He'd run it in. I had to face those. I, I had to run into the refrigerator on the, on the uh, goal line a few times. It Super wasn't pretty. No. Well, you were in there against that? Ooh. I was in there and then immediately ejected out of there. <laughs> All I can tell you, BC, is get low. You got to get low, and that's coming at you. He hit me so hard, my grandfather called me the next day. Brother had a headache. <laughs> My sister had a migraine. There is Gibson, who was the high school defensive player of the year in USA Today. Bam Morris is in. Bam gets it. But the Jaguars get him. Now we come to third down. The ball was advanced down close to the one-yard line. Third and goal from the one. Ryan Schwartz was the tackler, a rookie number 58. Now watch Gil Gibson get knocked out of here. Now we just built him up like he was going to be a Mack truck. And the defenders for Jacksonville ejected him. In a head-on collision. Nothing. Wow. Big down. Let's see what he might throw it. He is. Neil O'Donnell looks. Open man. It's dropped. Tracy Green, a tight end. Oh. Slipping out. He was open. What a play by Darren Carrington, I believe. Darren. His commitment to the play was such that he hurt himself. Like Darren might have got knocked out. Watch him at the end of this play, Don. He has to put his body in a weird position. He recognizes it. He's in between the two possible receiver. Goes up, gets his right hand on the ball. Oh, he hurt his 
It's a pull. It's a leg muscle. Yeah, it looked like he uh, pulled a groin. Yeah, it looked like a groin pull. So while Darren's attended to, there's a break in the action as the NFL on NBC continues. The Steeler drives stall, so for a second time in the third quarter, Norm Johnson drives through a field goal. And the Steelers inch back to within seven points of the expansion Jaguars. It's 20 to 13. Johnson will be kicking off for Pittsburgh with 315 left to play in the third quarter. Two long drives by the Steelers in this third quarter, but unable to get anything more than field goals each time. We'll be back with the Pittsburgh kickoff after this. NFL players do a lot of nice things off the field like Darren Carrington and his charity that he and his wife are involved in called Dreams Come True. And there's one of the beneficiaries, 18-year-old Billy Davis. Billy has a terminal illness. His goal was to, his dream was to get a jersey. You see Darren there giving him his jersey and come to a game. So Vicky and Darren Carrington hired a limousine to bring young Billy to the game. So that his big wish would come true and there's a nice guy in the National Football League and there are a lot of them. There are. What burns me up is you get a lot of publicity when you do bad things as a professional athlete when many of these guys a great number of these guys are involved in one of the The preponderance of good is overwhelming. It's but the truth. You don't hear good news on the 11 o'clock news. Nope. Here is the kick return now by Jimmy Smith. He gets out to the 21 yard line. Darren Carrington, of course, was the starting safety for the San Diego Chargers in the last Super Bowl. Tackle was made by Fuller on the play, number 29. We had 29 straight starts for San Diego. They caught him after the Super Bowl. There were some breakdowns in pass coverage, but there always are when Steve Young's throwing to Jerry Rice. He took the blame, but he was a very good pickup. And what a game he had last week in Houston. He keyed the victory as much as anyone. He had two fumble recoveries and an interception in the Jaguars' first win. And seven tackles. Yeah. <laughs> to boot. So he's a starter again, although <laughs> he did pull a leg, leg muscle, breaking up a pass. Pitch back goes to James Stewart, and he's out to the 22-yard line. James Stewart, Gary. And while we have a moment, let's go back to Greg Gumbel in New York for an update on the Oilers and the Vikings. Greg? Well, Don, the Oilers have jumped back into it against Minnesota. Warren Moon over the middle. Chuck Cecil picks him off. Watch the cutback. He returns 20 yards for a touchdown. They convert the two-point attempt, and it's now a 17-14 Minnesota lead on the Oilers. Back to Don and Diesel. And Cecil is a special guy in a special place. He is an unusual He's something guy. else. <laughs> Here's Brunel on the rollout. The rush comes and they get him a sack for Kevin Green, his second of the day. Our producer Kevin Smolin in touch with the Jaguars bench has been informed that Carrington has a uh, groin pull and will not return today. So the starting safety, one of them is out now for the Jaguars, who have the ball and hold to a 20 to 13 lead as they let the clock tick down. We're in the third quarter. Two minutes and 10 seconds to play in it. Brunel has been excellent at quarterback for Jacksonville. Long-haired Kevin Green digging in and teeing off. And a third and long play. Brunel gets time, fires downfield and hits grass. Incomplete. Mitchell was perfectly covered by the Steelers defense. You know earlier in this game I talked a lot about Brian DeMarco and his challenge to stop Green. Well last couple of series he has done a super job. We've got to got to praise him when he uh, adjusts to the speed of a Kevin Green. Talking to Dan Rooney the president of the Steelers he talked about having this team in their division is terrific because it's already a great franchise with maybe as good a stadium as there is in pro football. The Jacksonville Municipal Stadium is is really magnificent. Buffalo I certainly Houston. love it. It is beautiful. Buffalo now leading the Jets 19 to 10. Here's an opportunity for the Pittsburgh Steelers to get some good field position. Hit downfield. 
Ray Hastings lets it roll. It takes a bounce back at the Jaguars. Karam's out of bounds at about the 48-yard line. Just a 34-yard punt. And so there they will go on offense, will the Steelers, with very good field position. Next Saturday at 4.30 Eastern Time, join us for Atlanta 1996. We'll look at four new Olympic events being introduced at next summer's Olympic Games that you'll see here on NBC. That's next Saturday. Atlanta 1996 here on NBC at 5 o'clock Eastern Time. Could be a big year for Atlanta. Could have a World Series winner, but that's not decided yet. Some people call in the Braves the Buffalo Bills of baseball. They get close, but they've not won it since they were in Milwaukee. Neil O'Donnell, timing throw, not close, incomplete to Charles Johnson at the near side. Dropping back to cover on the play was uh, Vinnie Clark. That was the first uh, blitz that I've seen in a while from Jacksonville, so they are not going to be content to allow Neil O'Donnell to hit the seam pass and the big over-the-middle routes to Yancey Thigpen the way they uh, kind of backed off and played a soft zone in the last series. The one that put Pittsburgh in good position. So we'll see more of a challenge. The last time it was a blitz. We'll see if there's another on second down and ten. They go to the run. And Morris turns the corner and goes out of bounds at the 46-yard line. The Jets and the Bills, longtime adversaries in the AFC East doing battle. And we go back to Greg in New York. At Rich Stadium, Don, the New York Jets with Boomer Esiason down with a concussion. Bubby Brister, 16-yarder to the rookie, Wayne Kravat, who finds the end zone. But Buffalo has added a field goal, Christie's fourth of the day, and they lead the Jets 19-10 in the third. Don and Beasley. Thank you, Greg. Neil O'Donnell, the quarterback of the Steelers, talking to us yesterday. Get going back to the fact the longer that they stay in the game, the tougher they're going to be to beat. Referring to the Jaguars, and they're hanging in with the lead. A marker goes down as the pass comes in high to Andre Hastings incomplete. Jacksonville playing man for man defense and applying pressure. I tell you, I think that they uh, kind of evaluated their defensive decisions on the last series where they allowed Neil O'Donnell to play against the soft zone. The defense, number 41, he lined up in the neutral zone, five yard penalty. The measurement gives us a first down. There is Dick Duran, defensive coordinator for the Jaguars. Made a couple of nice defensive calls the last two plays. Unfortunately, his team jumps offside and gives the Steelers a first down. Those are the kind of mistakes. Boy, those are drive continuers and drive killers, depending on what your perspective, defensive or offensive. And across the way, head coach Bill Cower, the Steelers, talking about we need four good quarters. We haven't done that yet. They got stung early in this game. Down 14 nothing early in the second quarter with the Steelers. Now they're back. Two it in seven. O'Donnell looking long. He's got a man. He's open. And the ball is it. There's a penalty mark there, and the ball's caught anyway by Yancey Thigpen. The man who came in as a special teams player but's turning into a star. Now what are they going to roll? It's going to be against the defense. No. It's an interception. Mickey Washington, number took 25, the ball took the ball away. And Don, there's also a marker down. Yeah, they'll have to sort this one out. But just to go through the play, Steelers think they have the ball on the first down, first and goal. That will let the officials handle it. Yeah, they'll stuff. have to sort this out. But it was. Uh, that's why they come, right? That's why they bring them here. <laughs> <laughs> Told you they would. The Steelers rallying back. They'll have it first and goal. Well, this is an easy touchdown if Neil O'Donnell throws the ball far enough. Watch the hesitating go. Hesitate and go. So he's got to step on Washington. Washington have to actually grab Yancey's hand and pulled him back. Here's the other look. It's a gesture of friendship. See the see the elbow as he pushes him out of the way. But the actual pass interference came earlier when he reached out and grabbed his hand. That's a dangerous hit on O'Donnell toward the end, down around those knees oh, by 92, God. Don Davey. And he got him earlier and got flagged for it, Davey did. O'Donnell stands in, makes the throw. Yancey Thigpen, helmet to helmet hit. 
And he is knocked down at about the eight yard line. So believe it or not, well, it looked like a big play. Vinnie Clark's hard stick gave it just a two yard gain to the Steelers. Yancey Thigpen has put on quite a show. Four catches now for Yancey, 109 yards. And there's Yancey coming clear right over the middle. Ball behind him. Takes a tough hit. Only one gone. turnover. That by the Steelers. Bill Cower talking about cutting down on turnovers means focus, but you don't want to talk about it too much because people become so conscious they start getting tentative and keep turning it over. Here's Bam Morris trying in the middle. He protects the ball well with both arms, but he doesn't get close to the goal line. It brings up third and goal from the three. John Coughlin, the Jaguars coach, said everybody wants to run on us, but we're not easy to run on. No, he sounded very confident, and he has reason to be. You know, Jeff Lagerman and Joel Sminty, Kelvin Pritchard, Don Davey, those are no slouches. That'll do it for three exciting quarters. 15 minutes to go at Jacksonville, and the Jaguars still holding to a 20 to 13 lead. With Beasley Reese, this is Don Cricky back at Jacksonville. Steelers with the ball. Big down coming up. Third and goal for the Steelers. They're down by seven as we open the fourth quarter. O'Donnell gets time, throws high, too high. Andre Hastings can't come down where Yancey Thigpen can't come down. And so fourth down arises and for a third time, Coach Powers has to send out his field goal kicker for a point blank try. The plan was for Yancey Thigpen to break inside and then circle around to the back of the end zone and out jump everyone. The try didn't work. Boy, this guy's turning into a terrific player, though. Big Ten. 22 yard attempt. Big Ten broke loose last year for 36 receptions. He has 30 already this year. The field goal try by Norm Johnson is good again for the season. He's now 12 for 15. He's put up nine of the Steelers' 16 points, and they're back to within four. They'll kick off when we come back. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Mitsubishi, the new thinking in automobiles, by AT&T, your true choice, and by Windows 95 from Microsoft. Where do you want to go today? We're back as the Steelers are ready to kick it off after they've come to within four on the Norm Johnson field goal, his third of the game. A high kick into the wind. Coming up on the ball is Vaughn Dunbar. He is across the 20 to the 22 yard line. Jacksonville was one of the quickest expansion teams ever to win its first game. They weren't the fastest though. Minnesota Vikings were the quickest to win. They did it the first week they played football in the regular season when the Vikings under Norm Van Brocklin beat the Chicago Bears soundly back in 1961. Cincinnati won its first game and only its second game and the Bengals were in the playoffs in their third year which is pretty remarkable. Jacksonville winning its first game in its fifth game of its inaugural season. When will the second come. Well right now as we start the fourth quarter the Jaguars are in the lead. See the comparative numbers of Neil O'Donnell and Mark Brunel. Brunel at work now. The quarterback for the Jaguars stands in swings it out. James Stewart loses his footing trying to cut back. Al Boyd Mays positioning himself at the right corner to make the tackle. The Jaguar offense and coaches have done a very good job of picking plays. You see how quickly the pressure comes? Well, it doesn't matter if you've got a, a sharp, quick hitting, quick action offensive play call. They know that they have to stay away from the five and seven and nine step drops because they can't block it. Pittsburgh is too good. about five. LeVon Kirkland on the stop. You're going to like this run. He starts one way, cuts back, and runs through tackles. That's what makes James Stewart so good. There wasn't a lot there. He ran over Tom Myslinski, 
and Brian DeMarco, who did a good job at the point of attack. But even when Stewart was hit, he broke some people. Stewart, the 19th pick in the first round, he selected even before Rashawn Salam, the Heisman Trophy winner out of Colorado, was picked in the first round by the Bears. First down, Jaguars. Brunel against the blitz, stands in, lets it go long. He's got a man, and the race is on. Jimmy Smith will not catch him, and in he goes. He got a stride on Deion Figures, and Brunel hits him in stride. Uh oh, wait a minute. There's a penalty marker down in the Jaguars' backfield. It's coming back. This Jacksonville quad. Holy offense number 35. 10 yard penalty. First down. Holding is the call, and the touchdown is negated. How quickly <laughs> did this crowd go from ecstasy? to agony bottom of your screen you see number 35 facing Kevin Green okay I understand son you <laughs> did the right thing you have to hold him or get your quarterback killed that's a perfect throw what a great route unfair to Deion figures he's only that's right 75%. 78 80 uh, percent healthy lining up for the team Lining up because he needs Sudo to help the team. He's not really ready to be out there on the highway, which is what they call that cornerback position. This is going right down to the final gun, as we said at the outset. Steelers down by four. Dig in on defense as the Jaguars now have first down and 20 coming up. Or 22. Here's a blitz. They pick it up, go to the run, but the Steelers have got people in all the gaps, including Jerry Olsofsky. The former Pitt Panther who makes a big strike. Carolina has gone in front of Chicago in the fourth quarter, 20 to 17. Craig Cragen returned to fumble, a yard for a touchdown. You know, psychologically, Don, Carolina will look at Jacksonville and say, now, oh, yeah. wait a minute, they won. <laughs> That's right. Why can't we? And they beat Jacksonville in the preseason, whatever that means. Grinnell hit and dropped by Kevin Green. Three sacks today for Green. And the Jaguars are knocked back to their 15-yard line. Don, how many sacks did I tell you Kevin Green will get today? Well, you were looking for five from the defense. And they've and, had and more three than that. from Green. He's now getting officially two and a half he's credited for. Five for the season. And then with two and a half. I'm telling you, DeMarco is going to have trouble, has had trouble with him. He went around DeMarco that time. And it's not fair. I mean, it, no. you have to scheme. Schematically, you have to stop a Kevin Green. Pro Bowl players have trouble with it. That's right. You can't leave one guy to block it. Boselli's done a tremendous job on the other side against Lloyd, though. Yeah, Lloyd has been taken out. Brunel takes a look, runs the ball. He's crossed the 20, but way short of the first down, and the Jaguars must punt the ball deep in their own end. So the Steelers down by four will get the ball in what could be very good field position. Down by a 20 to 16 score with 11.52 to play in the game. Ryan Barker, who's been one of the bright lights of this expansion team's first season, an excellent punter for the Jaguars. Hands in, hits it downfield. Hastings comes up on it, makes it with his 34. Trying to go wide, and there's good. Special teams covered by Jacksonville. A 45 yard punt by Barker and a return of just one yard. The Steelers, down by just four now, will have it when we come back. The NFL on NBC is brought to you by Domino's Pizza. Call now and have Domino's deliver the ultimate deep dish pizza. Because when it's got to be deep, it's got to be Domino's. Well, after that touchdown was negated by a holding call, Lachey Maston, Kevin Gilbride of the Jaguars coaching staff had some heavy words for Maston. Then Coach Coughlin backed it up. Well, Don, I, tell you, I think he'll apologize once he sees this. If he had not yeah. held a guy, he'd, he'd be looking for another quarterback. And I think schematically, you don't put a little running back to block Kevin Green. That's as much Gilbride's fault as it is Lachey Maston's. 
And it brought back a 68 yard touchdown pass as Pegram runs the ball. Ball on the field. Looks like the Steelers got it back and got extra yardage when they did out to the 41 yard line. <laughs> Some writers were calling this Oktoberfest for the Steelers. And that they play the expansion Jaguars twice this month. Also go against Cincinnati and have a week off. But this is no party for Coach Cower. No, this he's is a tough time and he's getting it. Cincinnati's gone in front of Tampa Bay. There's a look at the schedule. Cincinnati, Jacksonville, Chicago. Big stuff on November 12th. I'll yeah, tell you that. November 12th. And the Browns come into Three River Stadium. You'll see Cleveland on many of these NBC stations in the doubleheader against the Lions of Detroit. Out pattern, wide open is Steve Avery, and he somehow squirms ahead on a second and four play. Gets ahead for a gain of almost 14 yards and a first down for the Steelers, who trail by four in the fourth quarter. Ten and a half to play in the game, the clock running. Avery ends up all alone. Other receivers had run routes that take defenders out of those zones, and Avery slipped into a nice little pocket. Avery playing in the Merrill Hodge role. Durable blocker. Good catcher when they throw it. Here's a long ball downfield. And whoa, is there going to be a marker in here? There is. There should be. Charles Johnson has been too tough for the corners to cover. They foul him way downfield. This game was going to go down to the final gun. Vinnie Clark was in such good position that I don't understand this being a call. You can look at the players running right beside each other. Clark squeezing him out of bounds. That is not a pass in it. That is not pass interference. Vinny had the superior position and the fans should be booing him. He had a half step in front of the receiver. He was looking back for the football. You're supposed to replace the receiver's steps. What you if you are you see Coughlin doesn't believe it. That's a bad call. Well, you play the position. You're in position to say that. For many years, 32-yard penalty, and the Steelers down by four, challenging. For the run, this is Eric Pegram, and he takes it down close to the 12-yard line. A great game, though, for television. Val Pinchbeck, the director of broadcasting, and the man who puts the NFL schedule together is here today. Last time we were here, the whole front office contingent of the NFL. Paul Tagney, the commissioner. Everybody was here on an opening day celebration as pro football came to Jacksonville in the regular season. Last week, the first celebration is the Jaguars beat Houston at the Astrodome. Now they're leading the Steelers, but the powerful Steelers are rallying back. Down by four, 20 to 16. Over nine minutes to go in the game. O'Donnell throws and overshoots. Eric Pegram as the rush was on. Jeff Lagerman applying pressure. I haven't heard much out of Lagerman today, but he is always a very active defensive effort. You want to see how he does here? There he is. Nice swim move to get inside, then correcting and chasing. Lagerman has been a standout. Now the Jaguars defense has to dig in. O'Donnell with a third down call. Third down and six. Deep drop. Here comes the rush. There's the throw. Makes the connection. And a submarine tackle of Steve Avery is made at the seven-yard line. And we'll see where the spot is. Mike Dumas, number 38, rocketed it in and cut down Avery. Mike Dumas is known for his hitting ability. Looks like it's going to be just short, Beasley, the first down. It's the most dangerous tackle in the game where you have to take on a guy that outweighs you by 40 pounds. Get low. Get low. Hope that like knee ankle high. <laughs> yeah, that can happen when you get low. That knee can go out and get you. Yeah. That's a dangerous tackle. Knee will catch you on the head. Wow. What a scenario now. The Steelers down by four points. Nine minutes to play in the game. Come up short on third down. And they're sending in the power package. Bam Morris comes in. Well, there are nine minutes left. So there's plenty of time. But this will go down as one of those plays that 
decides the outcome of the game. Gibson, number 98, the big lineman, is back in to block on the short yardage play. This is it. Remember last time on a short yardage, O'Donnell threw, but couldn't make the connection. The ball was there, but his man couldn't catch it. And Morris. Oh, man, this is going to be as close as it gets. If he's got it, it's by the nose of the ball where the linesman came in. Stop the clock, stop the action, take off the headset. Coach Bill Cower. Either say they've got it. I tell you, it's, it is a, a case of inches. I don't know if he's got it. This is something, Beasley. This is I love be, this. If he's got it, he might be about four inches short. Or if he's got it, it's by the nose of the ball. He's for short. The Jaguars take over the ball. What a game. A great league at its very best. Well, that helps the Shane Mastin status. <laughs> yeah, he's been terrific on this kid. Wow. Man, this is big time. This is. And I'll tell you this. The Steelers will be back. Well, they've got plenty of time. The Steelers will be back in this game. He makes it wipes his brow. He goes, <laughs> this thing would have been blamed on me. Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Hand off. Uh, Aguas trying to get some room, and the Steelers not about to give any. Greg Lloyd, number 95. Perhaps the most talked about outside linebacker since your friend LT, Lawrence Taylor. Plays the same kind of a game. Greg Lloyd. Um, Plays with uh, aggressive, bad intentions. <laughs> no guy, his opponents like Lagerman praised me. Said he's not a dirty player. Oh, no, he's, not at all. He is just a ferocious player. Second down, Jaguars need eight. Brunel steps in to give him a little time. He lets it go long, a daring play, and he overshoots his man. Cedric Tillman who cut a touchdown ball. And the Jaguar fans want one of those interference calls. But none is forthcoming. Al Boyd Mays, the right cornerback, who played for a Redskins Super Bowl championship team in 91 for Coach Joe Gibbs. He was the man defending on the play, number 28. Ran an interception back for a yeah. touchdown last week. Yeah, that was quite a week. Both of those corners, Al Boyd Mays and Will Williams, returning balls for touchdowns. Seven minutes and 58 seconds to play. One enormous play after another emerges in this game. Another's coming now. Third down. Brunel takes a timeout. And well, he should get all the counsel he can get as uh, Brunel and the Jaguars need eight yards on the next third down play as the NFL on NBC continues. We return to Jacksonville Stadium to remind you that coming up on most of these NBC stations, game two of a doubleheader day, the Browns versus the Lions in a big one. A lot of Cleveland fans watching this game, rooting for the Jaguars who are in trouble right now. Brunel on a rollout, heading downfield, and he didn't get there. The Steelers stop him on third down, and Jacksonville will have to punt. Doubleheader game for many of these stations will be Cleveland at Detroit. Some of you will see the undefeated Dolphins go against Marshall Falk on the Colts from Joe Robbie Stadium. In the West, the Seahawks visit the Raiders. Check your local listing for the game in your area. Kevin Green has three career safeties. Yeah, but the Jaguars had two men on Kevin Green that time. That's the way it should have been the entire game. Big rush by the Steelers, but Barker gets it away. Takes a high hop downfield. It takes a Jaguars bounce, and it'll roll dead at the 42-yard line of the Steelers. 44-yard punt, and again, no return. Well done by Barker. Having the kick from his end zone. 7.33 left to play. Down by Rodgers Green. First down, Pittsburgh. 
Neil O'Donnell getting advice from Ron Earhart, his offensive coordinator. O'Donnell with good numbers today. Has not been intercepted, coming back after a four week layoff with a fractured hand. Earhart, the offensive coordinator for a couple of Super Bowl victories with the, Giants. the Giants. He was. Been around forever. He's one of the best. And he'll need all his guile now, along with his quarterback, O'Donnell. Steelers need a touchdown. Here comes the Jaguars rush. O'Donnell gets it away downfield, and Figpen with a beautiful grab. Down to the 37 yard line. A 22 yard gain on the play, and the Steelers drive on. We welcome those of you who have been watching Cincinnati and Tampa Bay. Seven minutes to play here at Jacksonville. Don Cricky with Beasley Reese. Steelers trailing the expansion Jaguars 20 to 16. Pittsburgh with the ball. First and 10. Eric Pedram looks for room to run and find some as he gets down to the 34 yard line. Steelers need a touchdown. This has been a game of big plays. Only one turnover. That committed by the Steelers punt returner. Andre Hastings, which Jacksonville promptly turned into a second touchdown and a 14 0 lead earlier. Jacksonville has been very impressive throughout this football game, taking the first drive straight down, making a statement to Pittsburgh. The Steelers playing comeback right now. Neil O'Donnell returning after a month's absence with a fractured hand, playing beautifully for Pittsburgh. Stands in, takes a look, overshoots Avery. Coverage was there, and O'Donnell. Stops the clock with still a lot of time left to play. Six minutes and 11 seconds to go. The Jacksonville Jaguars are playing man for man and sending one or two blitzers at a time. And now those of you who've been watching uh, Cincinnati and Tampa Bay will send you back to that game after this update from Jacksonville. Third down comes up for Neil O'Donnell and the Steelers. He positions in the shotgun. They need six yards. What a play. Andre Hastings who fumbled the ball early and now the ball is separated from Hastings. He had it. He was struck hard by Mike Dumas. Roger Green picks it up but it's ruled an incomplete pass and this brings up fourth down. Another Momentous decision for the coaching staff of the Steelers. Hard hitting is a technique in football. It's not, you know, some people think it's strictly intimidation and things like that, but hard hitting is a simple technique that forces people to let the football go. Hastings knows he's in a dangerous position, outstretched, having to go high for the ball. Now, Donald came up limping after this play. Now the Steelers call a timeout. Before setting up for what would be a 53 yard field goal try. I'll tell you one thing, nobody's leaving this one. What a game! The NFL at its very best on NBC. Boy, we have it happening here at Jacksonville. Don Cricky with Beasley Reese. Fourth down arises for the Steelers with six minutes and four seconds to play. As you see, the favored Steelers down to the Jaguars. 20 to 16. Fourth down coming up. They set up originally for a long field goal. Now the Steelers will go for it. Go for the first down. Fourth and six. Steelers have done well on fourth down so far this season, but this is a long play. All out blitz is coming. Penalty marker down, and he is not close to Neil O'Donnell as he fires the ball over the head of the receiver. Yancey Big Pen, but let's see what the penalty call is. I love the defensive call by Jacksonville. Before the snap, a false start on the offense. Pittsburgh. The play is negated. Please put 604 back on the game clock. 604 back on the game clock, please. I love the call by Jacksonville. The offensive linemen see the blitz. They start to rock back just a little bit. What a gutsy call by the defense of Jacksonville. The all-out blitz is what they decide to 
answer the challenge of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh saying it's fourth and six. And, and the Steelers now will punt the ball. Yeah, they're going to punt it. That's right. You stop this once, stop us again, and Jacksonville does it. Then it'll be incumbent easily on the Jacksonville offense to run the ball and try to keep it away from the Steelers, who will be hunting the football. Oh, this is a dandy. This is why we do this instead of having real jobs, right? <laughs> There's the ticker, the Bill now commanding the Jets, 26 to 10, a team in disarray, the Jets. Dallas up on the Packers by 10. I'm telling you something, that blitz that Jacksonville called was no casual blitz. They sent everybody. They had the taxi squad coming. Everybody. You know, that's when your mindset is, okay, let's win it. You know, they didn't go zone, they didn't play half zone, half man, they weren't careful. <laughs> they said, let's take this game. Tom Coughlin, the Jaguars coach, says our game plan is to stand in the fourth quarter so that we have a chance to win it. They've led this entire game. The ball comes into the end zone, so the Jaguars, with 5.57 to play, will get the ball first and 10 at their 20. Trying to run some clock and keeping it away from the Steelers. Conditioning a factor in this game, hot and humid, although there's a breeze blowing. See the timeout count, each team left with just one. Coach Coughlin looking at the computer printout and the tendencies. They've gambled today, though, coming in with the 30th ranked offense, the last offense in the NFL. The Jaguars haven't been that today. They've moved the ball in this tough Steeler defense, and they've thrown when you least expect it, a lot of times on first down. Rennell, hands off. Steelers give nothing to the run. Winston Buckner and Jerry Olsofsky shut down James Stewart. Played to perfection by the Steeler defense. Started out with number 91, Kevin Green, moving outside to force the play to cut up. And when he cut up, he cut up into all of Kevin's friends. And there were many. Jaguars have not turned the ball over. See the total yards. Jaguars with an advantage in time of possession, but the all important numbers on the board. It's 20 to 16 to score. Brunel lost it up. Jeff Stewart. And a very good open field play by the all-pro linebacker, Greg Lloyd, who brings him down. Gain of only about three yards. A double zone that time by Pittsburgh. They had two safeties covering half the field, two corners covering the flats. And they they noticed the angle that Brunel is uh, pointing with his shoulders and look how everybody converges to make the play very little game. Dick LeBeau, the defensive genius behind this football team. Looks like they're lined up in another zone principle, a double zone. And another huge down, third down for Brunel. Here comes the Steeler rush. Brunel takes off. And they put a head-on shot on him. That was Lloyd who got him helmet to helmet. Wow. So that brings up fourth down, and the Jaguars have to punt the ball. Well, I'm surprised if Brunel got up after that one. Yeah, that looked like a knockout That tackle. looked like the knockout punch. Watch this. Clean as could be. Clean. Watch the end of it right here. Wow. Oh. Oh, that's a great low special. Huge punt, but Hastings will run it back. Nothing. Steelers cannot find a channel to open up. And the Jaguars sweep him under at the 22-yard line. A 61-yard punt oh. by the sensational Brian Barker. He's been as much a part of this Jaguar effort as anybody. Three minutes and 52 seconds left, Don. The Jaguar defense. Well, the coaches are checking uh, Mark Brunel out to make sure that he's okay after that tremendous strike by Greg Lloyd. Apparently he is. When you're hitting the head like that, they ask you things like, what town are you in? 
Like, who are you? Who are you? It's not funny either. No, I mean, it's not. You gotta, it gets that basic to see where your orientation is. First down, Steelers. They try to run. Nothing. As Coughlin says, they all try to run on us, but we're not easy to run on. Joel Smingy, number 99. Makes the knockdown as power now sees the precious second starting to tick away. Time very much a factor on this Steeler possession. The Pittsburgh Steelers ran into a um, little something they weren't expecting here. I don't care what, what you tell me. If they'd come in here motivated, pumped up, fired up, believing that they were about to face a challenge, they wouldn't be in this situation. Well, they know they're up. Yes. Challenge now as tough a one as they've been in. Here's a long ball. Yancey Thigpen's got it and almost breaks it. Thigpen with another standout play for the Steelers. Grabs it, going high to take it away from Mickey Washington. 29-yard game. Don Dumas went for the interception. He could have certainly hit Thigpen hard enough to make him let this ball go. Watch this. See Dumas flash by. He was looking for the ball. He thought he had an interception. Had he have gone for the man, Thickpen, he probably would have dislodged the football. Looks like another John Stallworth, a free agent with six yeah. catches today for 161 yards. O'Donnell gets time. He fires and makes the connection. Working hard is this rookie tight end from Washington, Mark Bruner, who fights his way ahead down to the 45-yard line of the Jaguars. It's an eight-yard, seven-yard pickup. Second and three, tackled by Harry Cole in the strong safety. Done. You, you just saw two nice and easy zones by the Jaguar defense. That will change probably now. They might run one more zone, but they... I would run, run one more zone and then get real tight man for man. Markers are thrown in. Penalty markers thrown in. Just stop the clock with the two minute warning given. Two minutes to go, and we come back to Jacksonville on the NFL on NBC. Two minutes to go at Jacksonville. Steelers have the ball, second down and three. Back pedal by Neil O'Donnell. Loose the ball down deep. There's Thigpen. He can't make the play at the 10 yard line. The sensational Yancey Thigpen almost burned him again, but the ball caroms away. Well, Harry Cullen will be credited with making the play here, but I promise you he is late. That should have been a reception and maybe even a touchdown. You see the slant in and go. It's a cover two. So the safety is charged with the responsibility of coming all the way across. Well, Cullen a little bit late getting there, getting the hand in. He has reason to celebrate. Steelers only 4 of 13 converting third downs against this Jacksonville team. This is third down and they need a long three. Incomplete and again fourth down arises for Pittsburgh. This time they have to go for it with 152 to play. Dave Thomas with the knockdown. Look at Jacksonville play defense. That's back to back big plays by the secondary. This is a team, the Steelers, who blew up the defending American Conference champion, the San Diego Chargers, last week, 31-16. This is a team many project as the AFC Super Bowl team. The expansion Jaguars have proven as tough as anybody Pittsburgh's played this year. The third critical fourth down situation for the Steelers. O'Donnell looks. He can run for it if he goes. He's got it. He could go for it. He, he had it if he ran. But he elected not to run. It was there. It was there. This crowd is going crazy. Everyone in the stadium is standing up. And the first down marker is about seven yards past that 50. Neil had to run about five yards. He pulls up looking for somebody Starting right field. now, if he runs forward, he gets it. Now you have to 
to make quick decisions and he thought he could hit somebody downfield and now get a room. You know, that, that angle shows you how much room he had. Probably would have had to lower his shoulder right at the end. And off, and the Jacksonville Jaguars now content to run the ball. The Steelers will have to use their last timeout. With 135 to play. It does a chance to tell you that the executive producer of NBC Sports is Tommy Roy. Coordinating producer of NFL football, John Ferratzis. His game was produced by Kevin Smolin, directed by Dick Klein. Associate director, Carol Larson. We come down the stretch run. The NFL on NBC was produced by Ricky Diamond and directed by John Gilmartin. As the Jaguars looking to run out the clock for their second win in the history of this young franchise. Just six games old. You beat the Steelers and you can beat anybody. I don't think there's anybody sitting down in this stadium. They're all standing up, clapping their hands. Absolutely a city in celebration over this football team. Wayne Weaver, its owner, a proud man of victory last week and now one at home. And the Jaguars content to put two arms on the ball and let time tick away. The Steelers now powerless to stop the ball. They're out of stop the clock. They're out of timeouts. <laughs> Will Power, who Steelers came out of a tailspin last week with the win over San Diego, now back in one and hits one of their key players down. It's like Kevin Green. Well, the fans are booing here. They're accusing. Oh, okay. <laughs> timeout to Pittsburgh. 40 second timeout. We will also reset the play clock to 40 seconds, and when the injured players are moved, we will yeah. wind the clock. See what happens to it here. The whole, the whole pile falls on top of him. <laughs> Buffalo on the way to beating the Jets. Commanding lead is the Jets really having trouble this year. Dallas wins against the Packers and extends its record to five and one. England was supposed to be hurt. <laughs> Throws for two touchdowns and a ton of yards. Look of overtime at Minneapolis between the Oilers and the Vikings. And maybe the same thing at Tampa Bay, where the Bengals and the Buccaneers are tied up. Now Kevin brings up and walking off under his own power. Chicago takes the lead over Carolina on a Let's start the clock again. Beautiful here. punt return for a touchdown. Tom Coughlin, the <laughs> suspect. Listen, if you're a stealer, he did the right thing. He do what it takes. But the clock starts up again. Third down coming up. You can't fool these officials. They put time back on the clock and then started it rolling. There's still 25 seconds to go on the play clock, so the Jaguars will line up. For quite some time, we now we'll have a conversation. Talking it over with the referee, Mike Carey. Walking confidently up to his center. Five seconds left, and they're going to run it all the way down and take yeah. the five yards, apparently. He's got a timeout. Right before the penalty, he calls the timeout. My friends, this one is. Over before it's over. What a beautiful Jacksonville is going to win this game on a doubleheader day on NBC Sports. And if you'll see the Browns go against the Lions at the Silverdome in Pontiac, Michigan. Others will see the Colts against the unbeaten Dolphins in Miami. And Seattle goes against what many are now starting to think is the best team in the American Conference, the Oakland Raiders. Check your local listings for the game in your area. Don, one thing for sure. 
quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars for the rest of this season. His name is Mark Brunell. He earned it in bits and pieces during the season. He was in and out. Yeah. No question. But today, he made a statement, and it will be heard around the National Football League. Yeah, this will rock the league. Last week winning in Houston was big news, but this is more than big news, and Brunel's not letting that football get away. He'll take that home to the Brunel Trophy cabinet as the coaches come out. Really the most significant win by any team in the NFL this season. Jacksonville beating Pittsburgh. This is big news. And they earned it. Prepared on both sides of the ball. You've not heard the last of the Steelers this season for sure. They'll be back, but Jacksonville continues as the expansion team that nobody wants to play. Former teammates in Washington, Mark Brunel, and the tight end from the Steelers, Mark Bruner. So the final score, the Jacksonville Jaguars 20 and the Pittsburgh Steelers 16. Coming up next, game two of NFL doubleheader on NBC. For Beasley Reese, this is Don Cricky. So long from Jacksonville. This has been a presentation of the NFL on NBC, home of Super Bowl 30.